The meeting is now being recorded. Hello, I'm Jose Cisneros, Chair of the Committee on Special Discipline Case Audit. Uh, the committee's meeting is beginning today, Tuesday, October 12th, a little after 12 noon. Um, we will begin our meeting. And Luisa, if we could uh, take the roll. Broughton? Here. Chen? Here. Cisneros? Here. Duran? Here. Seleg? Here. Shelby? You have a quorum. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we will begin our meeting with a call for public comment. The State Bar uh, will uh, take uh, members of the public who would like to make public comment. Uh, they have a limit of three minutes uh, to speak. And uh, members of the public um, can, uh, can signal that they'd like to make a public comment at this time. For uh, people who are participating by Zoom, uh, you should look for the virtual, the, uh, you should join them by virtually raising your hand. You should see a hand icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you click it, uh, to, you would click it to make public comment. Please click on the hand icon and we will um, notice that you are uh, asking to make public comment. If anyone is participating by phone, you may virtually raise your hand by pressing the star nine button. That is the, the star key and the number nine key. Um, that will indicate that you're interested in making a public comment uh, and we will let all, mem all members of the public who want to make public comment speak at this time. Um, Louisa, do we see anybody who's indicated they'd like to comment? We do not have anyone from the um, public who would like to comment. Okay. Thank you, Louisa. Seeing no one, we'll move on with uh, today's agenda. Okay, uh, great. Before we get started, Louisa, can you move Randy into a panelist position, please? I have, um, I believe he needs to, oh, there we go. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, Richard, do you wanna kick us off? Sure, um, well, we're very uh, pleased today to have with us uh, colleagues from north of the border in Alberta, Canada, with whom uh, Lee and I previously spoke after having researched some of the trust safety programs in Canada, as well as Australia. And uh, I will let them introduce themselves in one second, but essentially uh, they're here to present uh, broad strokes, the features of their trust safety program in Alberta and how that works with respect to uh, registration of accounts, the uh, review of the uh, of account data, auditing, and so on. They have a very uh, robust system of uh, trust safety regulation there. Uh, and I think there's some interesting uh, issues for us to consider from the perspective uh, that they are managed in Alberta. So with that short introduction, I will introduce the program director, Chomo Fudike, who can introduce herself and her colleagues. Just, just one second, Chomo, if you don't mind. Um, after we hear from our um, colleagues in Alberta, we will turn to a review of the memo and the proposed program design and options that we put forward to today um, to consider. We all, I, I've asked Randy DeFentorum from our Office of Professional Competence to join us as a panelist because at our last meeting, several issues came up about the rules. Um, and Randy, of course, is our rules guru, and he'll be able to weigh in on the rules implications of some of the um, program options that you all might want to pursue. And then after we turn uh, close out the discussion on trust account auditing, we will turn to malpractice insurance. And Linda Katz will give you an overview of the malpractice insurance working group and its recommendations. Um, and then hopefully you, you can engage in a discussion about whether or not you want to pursue um, that as one prong of the solution to the challenges we face. So I wanted to give that broad sort of overview of today, uh, what we plan to cover. And with that, Chioma, take it away. Thank you, Richard, and, and thank you, Leah. See you guys virtually again, and good afternoon, everyone. 
My name is Chio Maufodike. Officially, my title at the Law Society of Alberta is Senior Manager Risk um, uh, Finance, and I have oversight of the Trust Accounting and Safety Program. So I have two of my colleagues here with me, um, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Bernadette Sharon, who's the Manager of Trust Safety, and Casey McNally, who is from PwC. So Bernadette, um, maybe just Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, like Chioma said, I'm the manager of the trust safety department. I lead both our compliance and audit functions, uh, which I will go into in a bit more detail as we go into our um, presentation and excited to share about our program with you all today. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Casey McAnally, uh, director with PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, I'm supporting uh, Shioma and Bernadette uh, for the LSA. Um, in designing and uh, and administering a data analytics data analytics program um, uh, to assist in their trust safety program as a whole. Um, my background: I'm a, I'm a CPA and certified fraud examiner, um, specializing in data driven investigations and compliance programs. So thank you, Casey and Bernadette. So Leah, at this point, do you want us to go through our presentation, or do you want to? Okay. So I'll start by sharing my screen screen to share just with a thumbs up let me know if you can see it and um, we can proceed can everybody see my screen not yet not yet okay so just thumbs up maybe Louisa if you, when you can see it thumbs up perfect alrighty so that was the intro slide so the agenda for today, just take you very briefly through trust account of trust accounts um, that we have oversight for, um, understanding the data that we collect, the volume, the risk. And then I will turn it over to Bernadette and um, Casey, who will talk about our program key components. So our compliance program at a high level, the audits, and then the data analytics. So please feel free to ask questions at any time. We just want it to be very informative. So moving on to trust account basics, um, just like you guys, we have two types of two main types of trust accounts. It's called the pooled um, trust account, where um, it's one account in which all of the clients' trust funds are pooled. So it's a commingled trust account, and I believe you guys call it the IOTA um, account. Um, it's interest bearing, and the interest earned on that account um, is remitted to the Alberta Law Foundation. On the other side, we have what we call a SIBA, so a separate interest-bearing trust account that holds trust funds on behalf of one client. It's interest-bearing, and the interest earned there um, belongs to the client. So when we say separate interest-bearing account, what we really mean is just those low-risk investment type vehicles like your savings accounts, GICs, or investment certificates. Now, in trying to understand the volume and risk that we're trying to mitigate here in Alberta. I mean, in Alberta, we have about, uh, we regulate over 10,000 lawyers and about, I would say 500 articling students. Annually, an average of about $150 billion flow through lawyers' professional trust account. Any given day, there's about $2 billion on deposit. So that's the average daily balance that is at risk. Um, we have about 3,600 active pool trust account. So when you look at these numbers, essentially, collectively, the profession um, operates a small to, to a mid to large size financial institution. So we feel that the controls that should be in place should mirror that, that the controls of the financial institutions or banks. So just going into a little bit more detail in terms of the flow of funds, because this is the data that we manage. In 2017, 150 billion flow through. 2018, it went up to 178. 2019, it came down to 143. And in 2020, not surprisingly, it came down to 138 because of the global pandemic and, and the effect it had on interest rates and things like that. In terms of trust account, there's an inverse relationship. So you can see that um, as the flow of funds are decreasing, funny enough, the number of trust accounts that are being opened are increasing. And the only reason that we can give is that perhaps people were laid off and more and more um, lawyers are going out on their own and becoming solos or small, small, small uh, practitioners. 
Um, the number of responsible lawyers. So Benedetto will talk about this in, a, in, a, in detail. Um, I know Richard talked about trust account registration. So with res registration comes responsible lawyers. So responsible lawyer is, is, a, is a construct. So a way to centralize responsibility, accountability, and oversight of trust accounts within a firm. So the go-to person um, within a firm that's responsible for trust account and the numbers um, over the years from 2017 to 2020, we see that it has increased. So I'll stop there now. So that's our data um, on a high level. And I'll just turn it over to Bernadette to talk about um, what our department does in terms of mandate and objectives. And we'll go into the compliance program audits and, and stuff that you want to know about. So over to you, Bernadette, and I'll, I'll it for you. Thanks, Chioma. So when I look at the uh, mandate of what our department does in trust safety, uh, first and foremost, it is to protect um, the public interest and protect public trust funds. But we do that through supporting lawyers in the proper management, accounting and safeguarding of funds entrusted to them. And how we accomplish this, you can move to the next slide, Shioma. So the goals of our program, um, as you can see here is fourfold. So first is through um, compliance. We, we have programs to encourage, educate, and assist lawyers in complying with our trust accounting rules, um, the act and the code where applicable. Uh, we have deterrence mechanisms, which are to help um, deter mishandling of trust funds and accounts, i.e. part of our audit and analytics programs, as well as detection. So helping reduce the severity impact and total quantum of fraud loss as early as we can. Um, and credibility. So I think one big factor that we take very seriously is protecting the public interest and increasing the confidence in lawyers um, as their funds are entrusted to them and the public. You can go to the next slide, Shioma. So this um, is, I think, the crux of our whole program. It's broken down into three main categories, compliance and support, uh, audit and analytics, and education. So as Chioma had mentioned, um, we have a, a program where we uh, approve lawyers on whether they can have a trust account or not. And then we have one lawyer that is assigned responsibility and accountability and our key contact for all types of uh, reporting. Included under that for compliance, we have the application process to become the responsible lawyer. We have um, annual reporting requirements, as well as other reporting requirements, i.e. if there was a shortage in a trust account that's reportable to uh, our department, we have um, follow up and review of those. And as well, we have a general customer service line where um, any uh, lawyers in the profession or even their uh, support staff can call us with questions about the rule, practical applications, or if they have um, any inquiries of how to manage their trust accounts. Bernadette, can I ask a quick question? Are you going to go through these in a little bit more detail? Yeah, okay, definitely. Good. All right, yeah. thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then the second piece is our audit and analytics program. So our audit program uh, is driven uh, from two sources, I'll say. The biggest piece is the data analytics. Uh, so every year, lawyers submit their trust accounting data to us, and then we run analytics on it. We have some risk indicators. Casey will go into this in a little bit more detail, um, and that we use that to drive our audit program. Um, so within our audit program, we have... Um, I'll say different uh, variations of how we conduct our audits, whether it be a limited scope audit, a field audit, or perhaps a forensic audit when needed. Um, but the compliance uh, and the analytics kind of feed into how we develop our annual audit plan and how many audits we're going to execute during that year. And the last piece um, of our program, and I think this is one of the most essential pieces of our program, is the education outreach and awareness. So we have a lot of um, stakeholder education, not only with the profession, but also those who support um, the profession, as in bookkeepers and accountants. Um, we consistently have uh, webinars and uh, e-newsletters and bulletins really just educating about specific pieces uh, within our program. And we also 
when we were, I guess, live in person, we were also doing um, trust accounting 101 sessions kind of across the province just to provide more of that 101 interaction um, and learning. For now, we've kind of been doing everything virtually, but it's a really important piece of our, uh, our program. We can go to the next slide, Chioma. Approval. So this is the piece I wanted to speak to. Um, I guess it's the beginning of our program. I think the next slide has a few more details. Yes. So before um, a lawyer can begin operating their practice in Alberta, they have to apply to the trust safety department to become a responsible lawyer. And they would do that uh, with a trust account or have an exemption from a trust account. Either way, before they start, they have to get approval to become a responsible lawyer. Um, both that have, whether you have a trust account or not a trust account, you'll still have annual reporting requirements to us because we do still have some oversight over the general accounts of the practice as well. I Brenda, think this is, uh, I'm sorry, this is Ruben. Can I ask a question on that, um, on that slide? Yeah, so does, does a solo practitioner qualify as a law practice or a yes. law firm? Yes, okay. exactly. Yes, Great. exactly. So it would be any, uh, whether it would be a solo practitioner or if they were practicing in a partnership or even a larger law firm. Uh, with the larger law firms, we definitely acknowledge that there's usually an accounting department or a finance department that's helping manage that. But we still deal directly with the um, responsible lawyer on communications when it comes to annual filings. Um, or I'll get into kind of, we do have uh, a late filing fee program as well if they're not meeting their requirements and those all go through their responsible lawyer. So this slide really breaks down um, the accountabilities as a responsible lawyer and some of which I have already touched upon. Um, but when we first put this program into um, effect, I think what was important to have one one lawyer within the firm that we could communicate with and one lawyer within the firm that we could hold accountable from a conduct perspective if anything does go awry. So the responsible lawyer has the accountability for all the controls in relation to both the trust accounts and the general accounts of the firm. It's their responsibility to ensure compliance with the trust accounting rules and also ensuring that there's documents and documented evidence of their review, specifically when it comes to um, areas like trust bank reconciliations. There's an expectation that if you have support staff completing those and you've delegated those responsibilities, you still have ultimate review and oversight of those functions when it comes to the rules. Accuracy of all the reporting and filing requirements of the law firm, and I will go into those in a bit more detail as well, and ensuring um, all the payment requirements of the law firm relating to trust accounting are also met. And I'll go into those when I talk about the annual filing requirements. I think you can go to the next slide, Chioma. So for uh, reporting requirements, um, I have four uh, reporting requirements listed here, but I'll skip the first one and I'll come back to that one in just a minute. Um, but all responsible lawyers have an annual requirement to submit a law firm self-report. So what that is, it's a um, self-attestation of compliance with the rules. It's a series of questions asking about compliance of the rules. And at the end of that, they have to attest that all of that is um, true for that reporting period. Um, the next one, the next two are only applicable if they have a trust account. So if a lawyer has a trust account, they can either submit um, the data upload, which is the which is one year of trust transaction submitted through us through a portal. Um, and that's where PwC would perform analytics on it for us. Or um, I guess our legacy program was an accountant's report. An accountant's report is a um, an audit of specified procedures that a CPA would complete over um, the trust accounting records for that period in review. And so they would be providing us their opinion of uh, compliance with the rules. So the accountants program, the accountants report is our legacy program. We're trying to move away from that just given technology, technological advances, but there's both of those um, only relate to if you have a trust account. 
So the self-report lawyers are required to fill it out. Responsible lawyers are required to fill it out whether they have a trust account or not. It's a shortened version of the form if they don't have a trust account. Um, all of these reports are due March 31st every year, and it's for the prior year from January to December of the, of the prior year. And after March 31st, um, there is a series of late filing fees, um, three months of late filing fees, which are cumulative. And at the end of those, if we have not received both of the reports as required, and all the invoices are paid, uh, late invoices are paid, then a lawyer is subject to, could be subject to uh, an administrative suspension until they get their filings um, submitted to us. We, this was a recent uh, implementation from about, I think 2017, where when we were reviewing the number of delinquent reporters, the number was quite high. So we decided to um, change and make everybody on one unified, uniform filing deadline. And then it's very easy now for us to monitor compliance with that. And since we've done that, we have about, I'll say 99% compliance with um, our reporting requirements. So those were the annual reporting requirements. Now, if I jump, oh, Chioma, you can go back to the slide just for one second. And um, the first one listed there, which is the startup report, that's also a report that's required only if you have a trust account. And it's kind of our first glance of how a lawyer and a law firm is operating with their trust account. It's required to be submitted four months after they've received approval to open a trust account. And again, it also is um, a, audit of specified procedures, ensuring compliance with part five of the rules. And that kind of is our first risk indicator of how the law firm is managing their trust account. Now you can move to the next slide, Shioma, thanks. So now when it comes to our, our risk audit approach, uh, we have a risk-based audit program. And so as I mentioned before, our annual filings, um, combined with the data analytics we run from the data upload are what are the key inputs into developing our audit program on an annual basis. Um, we have the first piece listed here is the enhanced analytical review. This is where um, Casey and the PwC team go into uh, validating, processing, and risk scoring our data, and they visualize it into dashboards for us easily to be able to easily select audit candidates. From there, we slate our audits into uh, limited scope audits. Um, and prior to the pandemic, they were field audits, but now we're considering them full scope audits because they are being done remotely. Um, but the limited scope audits are specified audit procedures based on risk we've identified from their annual reports. And the uh, full scope audit is a comprehensive audit of all law firms um, with high risk indicators or high risk scores. So I guess maybe I'll just take a quick pause. Um, I've kind of gone over our program data and uh, the, the compliance program audit program and um, our annual reporting. Just a quick check if there was any questions or anything else that you'd like me to go into a bit more detail on. Um, maybe, hi, this is Jose. I just had a quick question. Maybe you're gonna cover this, but I'm just curious about who performs both the limited scope audits and the full scope audits. Is that actually, um, uh, government staff or is your, your outside um, partners or is it in different cases both? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, so we have an internal staff of auditors that complete the audits for us. So currently we have uh, a team of, I'll say five auditors completing the audits throughout Alberta and they're all um, Law Society employees. Can I... Um ask so you have for the legacy folks you're getting a, a physical accountant's report and I think Choma when we met with you you said you think it was about 80 percent of um, responsible attorneys doing the data upload and 20 percent doing this physical report um and then you have the law the law firm report so you've got like these data inputs some manual some automated and then the enhanced analytical review, Price Waterhouse is doing that for the um, automated upload, but you're doing it for the other things, the law firm report and the accountant's report. Is that right? 
Yeah, so um, I think for our loss, our law firm self report, which is just the self attestation by lawyers, we have um, our own, I guess, risk assessment process, but that's also automated through our internal system. So the lawyers enter it in, it's a digital form, and then it gets uh, vetted and risk rated um, automatically. And that also feeds into our um, into our audit universe. So it could be an auditable entity depending on how the risk score came out. Um, the one that is 100% manual, as, as you said, is our accountant's report. So it is only about 20%. Uh, I think it's actually decreasing every year. The accountant's reports we do have that's where my team of compliance analysts review and vet those manually. And then we also risk score those and refer, um, refer those to audit when need be if they're coming in as high risk. So we have a bit of a hybrid when it comes to manual inputs and um, automated inputs, but for the, I'll say for the most part, 80% of our inputs are um, automated. Okay, and then are you going to show us your risk um, criteria? It was really interesting. One, the volume, like the number of audits that you actually do each year, and then um, the risk criteria that you've identified. It was yes. really, yeah, interesting. I was just going to pull that up. But before um, I speak to the, can you, can you see this now? Yeah. 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 Okay. But before I start speaking to this, I, I wanted to to um to talk about or continue where Bernadette left off in terms of our um, self report because based on the document you sent me today, Leah, the self report, which is the the assessment of uh, the the law firm self assessment of their compliance with trust accounting rules, before it used to be manual and it was very difficult to vet and extract. Um, risk from, from a, a, a manual document. So we took that online. So we made it digital in the sense that every question, um, there is, um, should I call it analytics? analytics? Analytics built into every question and we rate it a low, medium and high. So I'll give you an example. Did you receive cash greater than 7,500? If the answer is no, it's low. That's what we expect. But if you answer yes, that is high. And the reason why we've risk rated them, um, because we have a risk-based audit program, at the end of the year, when after submission and we're vetting all of these results, we filter by risk. And we only pretty much look at those reports that have been rated either, um, responses that have been rated either medium to high. And that's what will fit into our audit universe. Because, I mean, you guys have over 250,000 lawyers. And from that pool, I don't know how many operate a trust account. But we have 10,000 lawyers in our membership, and of that, about mm, 1,800 or some, Bernadette, how many would you say operate? About 1,800 operate a, a trust account. So that's a lot. We have a finite budget and finite resources. So from that, we can't, we can't audit all of them. So we have to come up with a way to select our audit candidates. Each year, um, we have a budget to select, uh, to audit about 150 based on our four to five full-time employees. Um, so now we have to determine, let's build an audit universe. And I think this is what Leah is talking about. So this is what feeds into the audit universe. We leave a certain percentage um, for new responsible lawyers. And the reason being is that they're just starting out. Part of our program and our mandate is to help support the responsible lawyers. So we wanna help them when they're just starting out, right? So 5% of responsible lawyers will be in the audit plan follow up audit candidates. So in the prior year, if we've done an audit and it's rated high risk, part of the remedial action plan is a re-audit within six months or, or, or within a year. So we, we leave room on that audit plan, on the audit plan for follow-up audits. Firms that do not operate a trust account, this wasn't, this usually was not here before, but we found out that firms would say um, they, they don't operate a trust account so that they don't have to do all, they don't have to go through the administrative burden of submitting the reports, but then we find out that they're floating trust funds in their general account. <laughs> so we just wanna make sure that they're not doing that. So it's more for a check in place. Also firms that haven't been audited in, I put, we put here in why. So let's just go check up and see. 
large firms. Typically, um, as Bernadette said, you know, they have an accounting department and there was a pushback that no, they, they don't present any risk. You can't come in here. Found that, that through our audit over the past three years, there are some risks. So we do put large firms in our audit plan. And then, you know, the list goes on and on. We have here ETTR, which is the data upload that Casey would talk about, internal referrals from the um, from the conduct department, investigations, early intervention. So if there's a lawyer that they feel that is at risk, they would refer to us. And um, so when we, we take a look at all of these factors, the next thing that we do is now prioritizing them. Because remember, we only have spots for 150. We potentially could come up with 300, but we only need, we can only do 150 in a year. So we, we have a way of prioritizing um, the lawyers. And then from, from our audit universe, we build the audit plan that we would be auditing. We also leave space for forensics because in a year, we could have, you know, whistleblower allegations, right? Um, that something's happening. But remember, we only we still have the same finite resources um, that have to complete all of those. So, so that that's how we we build our audit universe, our audit plan, and and these are our, the way we prioritize the um, audit candidates to be reviewed. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. I don't know if you guys have any questions about that. Okay. I hope you guys are as impressed as Richard and I were. <laughs> like, wow, we, this is a, yeah, we got a long way to go. <laughs> it's very interesting. Thank you for the presentation, by the way. Oh, no problem. And the genesis of our program, because I know I asked Leah the question, so well, what's driving this change? Back in 2011, we were exactly where you guys were, right? But I believe there was series of misappropriations that caused us to do a temperature check to say, hey, let's do a retroactive review and let's determine the path forward. So what are we gonna do? And that's how we started. Um, they struck a trust safety um, task force that was tasked with reviewing all of this. And it was a subcommittee of the benchers or the board. And so three things happened, the registration of accounts, the approvals of responsible lawyer, and then the annual um, requirement to submit um, whether it's data or reports. And um, then, there, then there was a department to review. So how are we gonna review this given you know, our limited budget and finite resources? So we kind of have to be um, quite creative. One thing that I would say is if we're not, if you're not doing a risk-based audit program, the other thing um, that you'd have to do is audits of right but um, when you talk to accounting firms I guess the, the research out there is that um, random audits are, are, are quite risky right because the year after an audit is typically the most risky for a firm so if you come to me and you audit me this year and if it's on a cyclical basis and you say you're not we, I'm not going to be audited six years again from now that means I have a free pass to do whatever I like right um, but a pros and its cons because you could be auditing the same firm over and over again if they keep um, presenting the same high risk. And there are some firms that could be risky, but because they are not presenting any risk indicators, they may not be on your audit plan. So I think both schools of thought have their pros and their cons, but I think what we try to do is a combination of both, right? Where we're doing, you know, follow-ups, new responsible lawyers, firms that haven't been Audited in addition to, you know, the data or the insights that we get from either the reporting or from, um, or from the data. So with that said, I will turn it over now to Casey. I know this is what you guys really want to hear about. And um, he will speak to this slide. Thanks, Shoma. Pressure's on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so this slide just kind of uh, encapsulates our, our data analytics uh, program as both Bernadette and Shilma um, have kind of alluded to already in their presentation. So essentially I'll just kind of walk through cradle to grave uh, the process. Um, so the first part is data capture. Uh, so we have an online secure web-based platform uh, where law firms uh, will submit their data. So actual transactional data, uh, money in, money out, along with information uh, related to those transactions. They get uploaded in Excel CSV files uh, through this online platform. Overnight, 
Uh, we have uh, scripts in the background that essentially pull down that data, um, run it through a series of scripts, which is comparing the um, actual fields within the data. So the column headers, for example, the actual data, um, the files themselves, run them through a series of scripts um, and spit out on the other end, whether that those files essentially pass or fail that load and validation process. Um, what we're comparing to as well in that, in that process is our data model. Uh, so our data model will prescribe um, what are the fields in, for example, the trust transactions ledger, what are the fields or the column names that are required to be provided by each of these law firms? Um, if they have them, great. It automatically passes. It goes to the next stage. No further requests are made from the law firm. If it fails, an automatic uh, response or return request is sent back to the law firm to tell them your files didn't pass validation for one of the following reasons. You need to resubmit or you need to contact the law society uh, to figure out the issue. So as the law firms, the law society and PwC kind of work with them to get their, uh, their files uploaded and pass validation, then it goes to the next stage, which is automation and visualization. Um, so this is really where the bulk of our work and the value of our work resides in, the, in this bucket. And there's kind of two stages to this. One is understand and the second is analyze. Um, so the understanding uh, piece uh, of this bucket is really important. And that's where, you know, PwC and the Law Society came together um, with the Law Society's background, PwC's uh, specifically forensics background um, in building compliance programs and conducting investigations, um, leveraging kind of PwC's knowledge there, leveraging um, the Law Society's knowledge on past, um, you know, misappropriations of trust or of trust funds, uh, the regulators, uh, regulations that they're under, the law society rules to essentially develop what are our um, high risk uh, transactions um, that we want to look for in our analytics. So we built a laundry list of those um, and then we started to build scripts against those. So for example, um, is the law firm collecting cash over $7,500? So let's run that test across their entire set of transactions. And when I say run it, this is automated. So we built scripts, we ingest all this data from 1500 plus law firms. It gets run through these scripts. It tells us pass, fail. Yes, they did collect cash over 7,500. No, they didn't. Depending on how many times they did that. So let's say they have you know 100 transactions where they receive cash over $7,500 versus 150 transactions in total. Obviously, the magnitude of that is greater for that law firm and is going to be weighted a higher risk than a law firm who may have done that once or twice, right? Um, so we develop those scripts um, based on rules and criteria developed with the Law Society. We run that through uh, the transactional data and on the other end comes out a risk score. Um, so the risk score is done by law firm. So you'll have those 1500 plus law firms that submitted their transactions. We've run them through all our scripts and all our tests and it spits out a uh, risk score, which Bernadette alluded to, um, goes into the Law Society's uh, decision-making when they select audit candidates for the following year. Um, some of the real value in a program like this is it's not, it doesn't just stop there. It's not, the data is not stagnant then behind the scenes. Uh, the data is uploaded into visualization uh, software. Um, so not only can the Law Society visualize uh, the risk scores of those law firms. They can also visualize a ton of other, um, essentially whatever we want to build based on the data. So for example, how are lawyers interacting? How many transactions out of all transactions that we've collected are transacted by check? How many are transacted by cash? Um, which banks are they using? Um, so we can visualize basically anything from the data. It's uploaded into a, into a visualization tool, which obviously the Law Society has ac access to um, and their auditors as well. So that kind of brings me to the next piece, uh, their interaction. Um, so as, as the law society conducts their audits, they can be out in the field uh, pre-COVID or sitting at their desk behind the scenes, um, but they're able to not only request information of the, of the law firms and analyze that, uh, which they get from the law firms, but they can also refer to our visualization tool and, um, and the dashboard to see anything they really want to see about that lawyer. So say they're receiving information um, regarding cash transactions directly from the law firm. They can compare that to what our scripts have pulled out 
in terms of how many transactions they receive cash over 7,500, for example. That is a very valuable, uh, a very valuable tool for us and allows us to essentially um, update and uh, make our analytics smarter each year. So to the extent Law Society staff uh, get out there in the field and they understand, as you can imagine, um, you know, the scripts have pulled back something which is not accurate. It's a false positive, as we call it. Um, it allows us to refine those scripts and make them smarter and, and really try to pull out transactions that are truly um, indicative of something against the Law Society's rules or, or a risk of you know, fraud, for example. Um, maybe I'll leave it there for questions. Or so, Sean or Bernadette, feel free to jump. Go ahead. If I can add questions. So mm -hmm. in the process, um, if I understand your description correctly, PwC is handing off its analysis through the dashboard and, and whatever other communications to Law Society. If Law Society sees something, uh, it communicates to the law firm. PwC is not going back to the law firm other than the data quality assurance piece to get the data in in the first place. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So PwC has no interaction directly with the law firms. The only interaction would be through the uh, online tool where they submit their data. And then again, it's not necessarily PwC sending back. It's PwC has designed the scripts, but that communication back to them, LSA can see that communication, the law firm that can see that communication, and it would be LSA and the law firm communicating directly through that platform. And then do you do, in addition to looking at the individual accounts, do you, uh, and I imagine in collaboration with Law Society, do a sort of aggregate analysis, some sort of meta analysis to see, okay, across the whole province, you know, there's a, now there's a prevalence of this type of error, which might lead to rule change, might lead to clarifications, might lead to further training and education. So in other words, seeing whether over time uh, there's a, you know, drift or slippage in certain areas that needs to be addressed. Sure, I, I can let LSA speak to the the educational piece uh, that goes back to the law firms. But certainly, there are uh, there are analytical rules that will run across the entire population. Some of the visualiz visualizations in the dashboard are just that. What are the high level things we're seeing with respect to the use of trust accounts? How are they using trust accounts that LSA can use to help educate? That sort of thing. Another another thing I forgot to mention before I pass over to LSA is um, is, is some of the powerful uh, analytics that we run on this are comparisons to the population of law firms. So some of our rules touch on not only is a lawyer um, does a transaction the lawyer's trust account uh, violate the the seventy five hundred dollar cash transaction rule, um, but it'll also compare the transactions as a whole for that law firm to other law firms within our population. So for example, um, how long are estate law matters uh, outstanding for a specific law firm? And what is the usage, the volume of transactions in an estate law matter um, for, that, uh, for that lawyer versus the average of all other lawyers, for example, trying to pick out those outliers that based on the population of data, um, this is an outlier, this law firm is an outlier, someone you may want to look yeah. And then just in the education piece. So once that data and the visualization um, dashboard is brought to us every year, we look at the top five or the top 10 trends. And that um, helps, um, helps, helps us design our education program, right? So whether it's a targeted podcast or an e-bulletin or, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one session. Um, so in the past, so pre-COVID, um, bank reconciliation consistently year over year was an issue. So we did seminars, like Bernadette said, across Alberta talking about what is a bank reconciliation? When do you do it? So the technical requirements of that. So it just helps drive um, targeted education and awareness program. So any other questions for Casey? There's just, it, it, um, there's just one more slide that I wanted to kind of go over, which is the, um, I would say the, the genesis of the program. And I would just quickly share my screen here. These are the software packages, right? So right now we currently have 11, 11 now. 
So in order to make the data analytics program work, we have to partner with software vendors, right? And initially we started with the three main ones, PC law and e, well, the two main ones, PC law and easy law. But now the market for um, legal accounting software programs or so practice management programs, um, there is a lot now. So we get some of the software uh, vendors contacting us, they want to do a partnership. When we partner with them or when we approve them, we're just approving them for their trust accounting package. We're not signing off that this is the best practice management software to use. We're not advocating for them. We're just saying that we've given them our data model and you can use this trust accounting software package to upload your data to the Law Society of Alberta. So right now, like I said, we have 11. And um, that was the data model that Casey talked about. Um, there's a certain way that they have to design their tables so that it can be compatible with the upload program. Um, but I have to say though, in terms of if you ask me what the challenges are, this is where the challenge is, right? So working with a software vendor, trying to get their, their software to be compatible with our system in the data capture piece, try to normalize that data for analysis and, and cleanse it. So, so that's where, <laughs> if you ask me, that's where the challenge is. But when we get past that, um, it, it gets easier. I've often joked with the team that if I were to do this all over again, <laughs> in a whole different world, I would, I would um, create or build one software program where all the law firms must use in uploading their data. But people will argue with me that you're a legal regulator, you're not in the business of developing software, but I feel like if you had that one software where everybody can use and it's consistent, I think it would take away the time a lot. It would just reduce a lot of the time that um, PwC spends in, in, in getting the data ready, those tables ready for analysis, because that's where we have uh, the, the complexity arises. So that's essentially our program in a nutshell. So maybe what I'll do now is stop sharing and I'll open it up uh, for questions. Well, so I have a question. How, how does, would you say your program compares to that of Ontario or British Columbia? And do you guys collaborate across provinces to share lessons learned or solutions? Or are they yes. very discreet? Yeah, we collaborate a lot. So in fact, we do have, we just finished our conference last week. We have what we call a trust assurance group where um, I guess trust directors and managers, people who have oversight of trust accounting in each jurisdiction, we come together to collaborate, share resources, questions, rule changes, whatever the case is, it's just a collaboration um, team from a federal level, right? So how, do our, how does our program compare to that of um, Ontario and BC? So you've mentioned the, the two other biggest provinces, right? So I would say it does compare. Um, I'll, I'll speak about BC and maybe Bernadette, you can talk about on Ontario. Um, I know that BC has a component of data analytics, perhaps not as robust as we do, but data analytics helps drive their audit. So before they go into audit a firm, um, internally in-house, they've created scripts where um, each law firm, so the law firm that they're dealing with um, uploads or exports certain files from their software vendor in Excel, right? So they export it, when it gets to the law society, they amalgamate it and then they run scripts against it looking for certain patterns, trends and anomalies. And then that drives um, you know, the areas uh, or the program or what they'll be looking for. But for Ontario, Bernadette, you have uh, an idea of what Leslie they're doing out there? Yeah, so in Ontario, I would say um, they don't use analytics in their specific audits per se, but they do have analytics similar to us for their annual reporting where they, um, I guess, risk rate or bring out the risk indicators from annual reports, which helps feed into building of their, um, their annual audit program. But I will say um, across the board, Alberta is the only jurisdiction that has a, a fully 
risk-based driven plan where uh, we don't have any audits, we audit just on a cyclical cycle. Um, or as an example, in BC, all firms are audited every six years on that cycle. However, if there's risk indicators, they could potentially add those on to their audit program again. And that's similar in, in Ontario. Um, so because they don't have um, any of the analytics um, across the board like we do, they don't have the same level of indicators for risk uh, to really pull that risk-based audit program. So I'll say when it comes to the audit planning process, our process is a bit different than the other jurisdictions. But when it comes to our compliance audit procedures, those are uh, very similar. And that's really what we do share about in the trust working group across the board. What, what are best practices when it comes to our audit procedures? Where do our rules align? Where do our rules um, maybe not align? And is there room for improvement um, across the board? Thank you. Maybe I can just add from a, a non specifically like law societies, um, but just from from my uh, background and compliance. Um, I, I think one area that is that is similar to this risk based audits and, and risk identification is is obviously banks. Um, and that's a big one, especially in the US, but also in Canada is is moving. I mean, they have programs already, but PwC sees a lot of work. Um, in banks compliance functions to identify those high risk uh, clients, high risk transactions, as well as companies are moving uh, that way. Some of the larger companies and, and definitely the US has been, uh, has been all over this for many years, um, but internal audit departments of companies are not only, uh, are, are not kind of randomly sampling as Bernadette kind of alluded to with randomly sampling audits. They're not randomly sampling transactions or processes within their entities anymore. There's, there's a growing expectation amongst regulators that you have the data, you should be using it, um, and you should be using it to identify those risks. So more and more, we're helping clients uh, build compliance programs, which are leveraging accounting data, vendor data, putting it all together and showing the internal auditor, showing compliance team, here's where your risk lies and here's where you should focus. I think Mark has a question. Yes, actually, I, I guess I have a number, but I, I'll i throw a few out there. I just want to make sure that I understood um, sort of the scope of what you were doing. Did you say there were roughly 10,000 attorneys that you were uh, applying as a program to, or was it 10,000 responsible lawyers? So in Alberta, we regulate 10,000 plus lawyers. But out of that 10,000 plus lawyers, only about 1,800, I would say, um, operate a trust account. So we apply this program to 1,800 lawyers. I would say more than that because we also look at lawyers who do not operate a trust account. But let's just say trust account, 1,800. Okay. And um, if I understood you correctly, you were doing about 150 audits a year of those 1,800 or 18%. So yeah. it's roughly 18% of the number of attorneys in your jurisdiction is what you're looking at. And if we have 250,000 uh, attorneys here, we're looking at four and a half million uh, attorneys that we would be uh, applying this to, which equates to at 18%, roughly 360,000 audits a year. That's a pretty big number um, if we used the same um scope uh that, that you're doing may i ask um, mark 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 just i i just want to make sure we're clear on the number so um 250,000 260,000 total number of licensed attorneys of that about 195,000 are active attorneys the remainder are inactive so if you took 18 percent of 195,000 that's 35,000 is 18 percent so I, you were talking in the millions there and you were sort of confusing me. So I just want to make sure, yes, it's much bigger than Alberta, but we're not talking in, in the millions in terms of our numbers of attorneys, potentially. But Okay, but okay. I wanted to get a sense, make sure that I was using the right numbers and scope and, and so forth. Um, and you have an entire department, if, if I understood you correctly, that, that runs this program, internal and perhaps some of it external. Is, is there a ballpark? cost to this and maybe if you can't answer that how do you have it, it, do the attorneys pay for 
that program? How is it paid for? Yeah. Okay. So we'll talk about talk about cost. So a few questions here. Let's talk about cost. Talk about our audit rate percentage. So, so eighteen percent. It's typically so we do one hundred and fifty. I think um, Ontario does over about six to seven hundred. So I would say that that's essentially the the issue, right? So you have say thirty five thousand people, lawyers or attorneys. Out of that thirty five thousand, perhaps twenty thousand operate a trust account. Let's for for simplicity's sake. So now you have an audit universe of twenty thousand. What is your budget, right? And how are you now going to prioritize these lawyers to 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 build an audit plan? that's always that's the number one issue in any audit department so that's what we struggle with when i said you know um this is how we prioritize and these are the factors we consider because we only have um space for 150 right so that's one in terms of cost no we do not um we do not charge so everything we have brought our audit program in-house previously it was outsourced to um deloitte and then pricewaterhouse and then we brought we now operate an in-house operating model where we have, I say four, but we're recruiting for one to so five auditors who, who run this, right? And the audit side, and then another four on the compliance side. So together about, let's just say 10. Um, lawyers do not pay for the cost of the audit, but they may pay for the cost of a re-audit if they're rated high risk more than once. Um, the only thing that I would say that they pay for is when they, um, when they hire or engage a CPA to, to perform, uh, to complete the um, accountant's report. And the cost of the accountant's report ranges anywhere between 2000 to 2500 doll, Canadian dollars for a CPA to conduct the specified procedures and furnish that accountant's report to the law society. But short of the accountant's report, the data upload, the, the, the compliance, everything else, um, we operate an in-house audit program. And uh, like you guys, our budget is largely driven by membership fees. So I don't know if that answers your question. So just a quick follow-up. I know, Sean, your hand is up. But when you implemented this in 2011 and as you've grown it, did the um, licensing fee or the membership fee get adjusted accordingly or you had enough like cushion in that membership fee to support the launch of this new program in 2011? Oh, I can't really speak to that, but <laughs> there's a num number of factors that that, it, that our CFO considers when they're building, determining the, the membership fee, right? So it's a bottoms up um, budgeting process where each department comes up with their budget, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of factors that they consider than, um, than trust safety. What I would say that largely drives the um, indemnity, right? When, the cost, when misappropriation goes up, because the profession bonds its lawyers, there's a direct correlation or relationship between you know, misappropriation, misappropriation of trust accounts and high insurance fees. So that I know that there's a correlation, but for membership fees and how they set those fees, I, I just know that, you know, there's a lot of factors from the ventures or the board of directors, from the department needs operationally and, and everything that from the strategic plan and not necessarily trust safety. Trust safety is just a, it's a program, right? Yeah. Don? Um, well, first of all, let me just thank our guests. I mean, uh, wonderful presentations so superbly organized and concise uh, and uh, a very impressive program that you've described to us. When when we first started discussing this whole topic, I thought, well, California might be a leader in the area, but I think I think we're going to be a follower <laughs> of, of the good work that you all have done. So I have two questions. Mark actually asked my first, which is about the cost. So you mentioned that you have nine auditors on staff. How many other st staff do you think are required to operate your program? Um, so in-house, nine to 10, let's just say 10 for argument's sake. And then on the PwC side, mm, how many people support our program, Casey? Yeah, myself and probably three to five others. Um, and that's not full-time. We go in peaks and valleys throughout the year. But uh, yeah, probably three to five from PwC side. Yeah, so maybe 10 to 15 or something. 
the other question is uh, more substantive, which is, so in doing all this work to date, have you, are there any sort of high level um, risk factors that you can identify? So for example, in our discussions, we perceive one risk area as uh, what I would call large trust accounts, which means either lots of clients, lots of transactions, or relatively large sums of money, because all of those things can basically cover up deficiencies in trust accounting because the checks aren't bouncing, but there's a problem with the account if you really dug into it. And so if we were to, your program is much more sophisticated than this, but if we were to have some kind of a rule or get selected people for audits randomly, or we had a rule where certain trust accounts had to, certain operators of trust accounts had to um, submit more material than others or whatever. Do, I mean, have you, at a high level, do any of those risk factors ring true to you, or is it much more complicated to identify problem attorneys, trust accounts? Uh, maybe I'll take a stab at this, and maybe Casey and Bernadette, you can kind of jump in. I would say it's a combination of factors, because just having large balances of flow through a loan may not necessarily be that risky. By the nature of things, large firms, right, will have more transactions than a solo practitioner. Um, I'll give you a, a, an example um, that I know that has generated a lot of risk. So this that BC uses and which we've started implementing in our audits. So show me um, any withdrawals or debits less than fifty dollars um, from a trust account to a general account. Now that value is small, but that's the way law firms try to clean up their trust account. If, if um, so they haven't earned the fees, but they have no way of applying that, but then they're just transferring it to the general account. And the question is why, right? It's a, it's a small dollar value, but over time could present something bigger. So just imagine if you did that, found firms, and then you went there, there has to be a legitimate explanation as to why you're transferring small incremental balances to your general account, right? So that's something small. We talked about, um, um, you know, shortages, right? So shortages could be on a matter level and could be on a bank account level. So just shortages just means when um, the matter is in an overdraft um, position, right? So you're just looking for negative balances. I think to me, that would be the number one risk as opposed to just a large dollar value. But we do have rules that says, you know, show me transactions greater than half a million, um, but over time, it, it just has to be a combination between that and something else because large value alone doesn't, doesn't necessarily, somebody in real estate will have more transactions and more dollar value than somebody in criminal, right? Or, or a, a state or, or something else. So different, different rules for different, um, we have money laundering rules. Um, it's really big out here. Um, and then we also have, you know, the, the trust accounting rules that we write scripts against. So. Thank you. I don't know, Casey, Bernadette, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I can just take a stab at adding a few pieces. Um, so just looking at the way, I guess, the composition of our annual audit plan and the risk factors that lead into that plan, 70% uh, of our audit plan are sole practitioners. So those who are either practicing alone with or without any help. And we find that's a big area of risk just because of the lack of oversight um, and segregation of duties as you would have with a larger firm. So as Chioma said, some of the larger firms would have the largest value, um, dollar value flowing through and the largest number of transactions, but because they have a certain level of oversight, segregation of duties and controls in place, they could be deemed as lower risk. Um, so that's one of the factors that we, we look at. And I know at first Chioma kind of shared the, um, cri criteria we use for prioritization of our audits. And some of the um, risk factors we look at at a high level, one of them is uh, the size of firm. So whether it's solo practitioners, medium or large, we risk rank them with solo practitioners being the, the highest risk. We also look at area of practice as Chioma mentioned. So real estate and estate um, being higher risk when it comes to uh, trust funds and perhaps, um, you know, family or immigration being lower for trust. So, and we've done that just based on the analytics we've been provided through or the data we've been provided from our um, partners in our indemnity uh, program. And then also other areas we look at are um, the correlation between 
uh, the details are giving us about their trust account. So with the self-report, a combination of looking at the self-report and the data analytics, what are some of those key rules that are being broken? And I think Chioma already hit, hit that nail on one as far as shortages. So if there are shortages detected in either their data analytics or they answer that, yes, we have shortages on our um, in our uh, trust accounts, either of those would automatically become high risk indicators and uh, potential audit candidates. And another one, which we found as a um, area of fraud or could be used as fraud are inactive accounts or undisbursable trust funds, where there are accounts of over two years of no activity. Those are at highest or at greatest risk of misappropriation through if you will, a lapping scheme. So taking from one and moving to another, it could go undetected if lawyers are not reviewing those inactive accounts or if we're not um, you know, actively reminding lawyers that this is, you should not have a large amount of undisbursables. And so that we do see uh, quite often, we have seen examples of misappropriation through the use of those accounts and those could be easily hidden if there's not the right controls in place. So I think those are the two biggest risk factors that we see uh, that lead to, that could lead to, you know, theft, misappropriation or, or loss of funds. Mm -hmm. And then one more thing that I'll just add, which is quite it's on an ad hoc basis. So if the conduct department, um, perhaps in conjunction with um, the police are investigating like a, a money laundering case or a lawyer for fraud or whatever crime they've committed, we could, we could take the names that they've provided or the clients or whatever and run it against the system and come up with you know the unusual payees right so then we we now know that you know that particular payee was working with not just this lawyer that you've apprehended but the these are the lawyers that they could potentially look into right so because we have the data we have the names um we can use it for other purposes because the lawyers cannot they're prohibited from using um the yeah, trust account for money laundering purposes, obviously, right? So, <laughs> um, so th that that's an unintended unintended consequence, but we it helps, right? The data helps us. Great. So, do you see the hands, Ruben? I mean, Jose. There's uh, Ruben and Mark. Have their hands up. I, I apologize to everyone. I have to leave about 115. So I want to just ask this question quickly. Uh, you used the word bonded, and that's something that I've actually looked at here a little bit. Um, and I found out that one of the uh, major firms here in town I was talking to about their trust account management, they do some collection work for banks. And the banks actually require them to have a $2 million bond uh, that covers the amount that they're uh, recovering for the bank. And I know this is something we talked about. I tried to investigate it a little bit and couldn't get a lot of information from insurance companies as to whether or not they would actually uh, issue these bonds, which I was told was called fidelity bonds. But I'm wondering, since you used it, how is that um, used in uh, among the lawyers there in your jurisdiction? Okay, so twofold and I and I have to put the caveat there I'm not <laughs> I'm not from the insurance arm so I will just speak to how it relates to the trust safety program right um when I use the term I think I said that the profession bonds is, is its own lawyers meaning that the way our insurance program works they have part a insurance which is the professional liability insurance and they have the part b which is the misappropriation um so if you operate a trust account, you have to pay part B, right? And then if there is a misappropriation or theft from trust account, they pay out from that fund. Only deals from a trust account, the fund will pay out. If staff, law firm staff misappropriates from the trust account, it's not covered by the part B. So this is where we encourage law firms to carry the fidelity insurance because if you, the professional liability insurance will not cover theft by staff, ultimately the client is out of luck, right? So we encourage lawyers to carry fidelity insurance up to a maximum of what, what flows through their trust account. So I think that's, that's the context. Of, so when I say the profession bonds its own people, um, the Part B insurance covers misappropriation um, committed by lawyers, 
and then the fidelity insurance is encouraged to help cover theft by staff. Otherwise, the 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 clients will have to sue the lawyers um, to get their money back, right? Okay, Ruben. Thanks, uh, Jose. Bernadette was talking about uh, different practice areas and how they fit into a risk uh, continuum. And I think I think you said that maybe estates and uh, real estate were at the riskier end, the higher end, and family law being at the, the lower end. Um, where does personal injury and or um, class action practices fit in that continuum? Mm. I'm just looking at our chart here. I'll probably say other, which is low, right? Um, I'm not sure, Bernadette, do you have another take on that? Personal uh, injury and class action? No, I... I agree with um, Shioma that that is either between lower medium. I think the reason is with what we've seen here um, with the class action, usually the money is going in, it could be large dollar amounts, but there are usually the beneficiaries of where that money needs to go to. So there's a clear audit trail of where it needs to go to, um, you know, varying from an estate file where it could be um, in dispute for for a lot of years so i think um larger dollar values when it comes to the civil litigation um civil class actions and stuff we have seen the biggest area of risk that we've seen is when they're um they're going on for years and the lawyers um, by the time some of these claims are settled lawyers are unable to find the clients or their beneficiaries. So a lot of those do end up as undispersable and our undispersable funds flow in back into the Law Society of Alberta if they're unable to locate their clients. Um, but when it comes to risk on a day-to-day -day transaction basis, we we deem that those as, uh, as lower to medium risk. And that, I think Shioma, we got that data based on ALIA claims. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. indemnity claims, we've kind of based our risk rating based on the um, indemnity claims from our, uh, as we call them, Aaliyah. Yeah. So the rule of thumb is if the funds are going to sit for a long period of time and no one's asking, so the law firm is unable to locate the beneficiary beneficiaries or, or that litigation is taking a very long amount of time, it's risky because if the lawyer borrows the money or if the staff steals the money, there's nobody that comes right away to say, hey, I need my money because the case is still ongoing. And we've seen in a way when we've analyzed all the past misappropriation cases, estate files typically are the, the number one, the, the riskiest um, area, um, practice area for lapping schemes, right? Because when one is being paid off, then you take from the other one and you just keep going to cover ups. So nobody's really asking because you can't, you're unable to locate the beneficiary. Real estate is another one. Large volume, but a lawyer can misappropriate by not paying off the title, right? You would think you're done with the sale or the purchase of your house, but if the title is not, or if the bank is not paid off, you would never know until six months later when you start receiving letters from the bank that you're defaulting. So we've, we've kind of taken this from the insurance arm based on claims that they're getting, and we just kind of bucketed them into low, medium, and high, so. Yeah. Well, Jose, can I ask a follow-up question on that real yeah. estate piece that Chioma just described? Sure. Um, it sounds to it sounds to me well. It raises the question in my mind whether uh, Canada employs an escrow um, aspect to real estate transactions because what what you've just described, where there's a seller or a purchaser of a house who doesn't get their money until sometime after the you know the the title has passed. I think in California, that's all uh, regulated and governed by escrow companies and, and the lawyers stay completely out of it. So I'm wondering whether that's why real estate's a higher risk area for Canada or for your province. Possibly, because I know you guys have title, yeah, different setup, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, Richard, did you wave your hand for any comments or? Uh, no, thank you. If not, then uh, Sean, did you put, have another question? Go ahead. Just a, uh, a variation on Ruben's theme. Um, 
for our for our staff, I think you might add to your research agenda. Um, what Ruben said is 100% true that it's, uh, I've never seen an attorney do act as the escrow agent for a real estate transaction in California. But I think we, and there are escrow companies that do that and they have to be licensed and have all kinds of requirements. But um, I think we ought to look into whether California lawyers are permitted to provide that type of escrow service because um, we might want to look at banning it. I mean, there's really no reason for a lawyer to act as escrow agent in a transaction like that. And I do know that lawyers act as escrow agents in other types of transactions, like um, uh, basically it's certain types right? of securities yeah. offerings yeah. and so on. Now, most firms will not agree to do that you know, um, because it's high, high risk. And so I know my firm, for example, we do, we simply do not do that. They have to go to an escrow company and pay the relatively nominal fee to go to a, a company that offers that service. Um, because we just, it's just, uh, I would never advise a lawyer to get involved in that. So we might also consider whether to uh, just bar lawyers from acting as escrow agents in any type of transaction because we the state is full of qualified escrow companies that are licensed and regulated specifically for that function. So it's worth looking into, I think. And we have the right person to do that, Randy. I'm sure he I'm sure he already has thoughts on that. I just um wanted to ask us a, a question as we prepare to go into a discussion about what our nascent program should look like. Um, Chioma, I think you made, um, well, all of you have made a great case for not uh, starting with um, a random design. But I think one of the challenges we have is we don't have the benefit of all this data to pull from to create our risk profile from the outset. And so I'm wondering if you would have any advice for us in that scenario where we just don't have this robust you know, repository of information to develop our risk profile. Um, I think we've been thinking about starting randomly, then using the data to inform the development of a risk profile, but any advice on that front would be very appreciated. Thanks, Leah. I actually reviewed the information that you gave me, and I know that um, you're probably going to review this. I, I don't want to preempt any discussion, but um, if I may, because uh, I know the team, we have to leave at 2.30, so I'll just share my screen in, um, with my, my recommendation, right? Um, so I'm not sure if the rest have had a chance to see this, but if I was designing a program, this is what I would allude to. And, and I guess with the challenge of not having data, like prior data, um, this is what I would do from the onset. So the self-assessment, right? I would recommend that it be completed by all attorneys annually. So everybody, regardless of whether you operate a trust account or not, because it's a way to kind of give you data insights. And then you can get that detailed trust account information about the flow of funds, the financial institutions, the account number, whatever the case, like you get data that you can use for decision-making, right? And then you can also get that annual certification of compliance from everybody that they're doing yes or no. And in that self-assessment, you design the questions in such a way that on the back end is risk rated. So the, depending on their answers, it could fall into the low, medium, or high category. Once you have that self-assessment risk rated, then that's your input, right, into your audit program. And then the next one will be the compliance review where you can now complete it based on a risk-based sample. If 50% of the self-reports or self-assessments are coming up as medium or risk or high risk, now you have only 50% to deal with, right? So that kind of flows into it. And then like we talked about, you can also add, you know, new firms, helping them, supporting them. Um, you could look at um, practice areas, which ones you think are, are riskier, right? So from, from that, you can now start filtering down, you know, who you want to audit. And then, the only my only caveat in this second bullet point where it says conducted by CPAs, um, secured by attorneys using forms developed by State Bar. I just put here if you're requiring all this, I think the pushback from them will be the cost. I don't know how much it will cost in California, 
but in Canada here it's about 2000 to 2500 and it may be higher depending on the firm that you go to. Um, so just be mindful of that, that about the cost, right? And, and how a solo practitioner who has less than 10, 10 clients will pay for that, right? So, and then I just put here recommendation. So once you have um, the self-assessment, they submit that online or the accountant reports um, or this report that has been done by the CPA, they submit it online to the state bar. Everything should be so that there's um, risk attached to each question and um, you can pull from them. And then I just put here risk response. So an audit is a risk response, right? So you don't have to audit every single attorney or every single firm. So based on the information that you've gathered from the self-assessment, based on the information that you've gathered from the review by the CPA, then you can determine a response. Do you close the file? Do you refer for investigation? Do you do an audit or do you simply freeze that trust account? What I mean by freezing trust account at the bank level. So you're stopping all activity until they perform certain actions to get their books and records in compliance. So an audit in my mind is a risk response amongst other things. Um, everything here, like the, um, the report that is being performed, the specified audit procedures being performed by the CPAs, and your self-assessment is an assessment of the risk level. And then you choose to respond to it the way you see fit. So that would just be my, my recommendation. Um, and of course, nothing stops you from doing a combination of random, random audits with this. But um, I see case we can add to this and, and Bernadette sure. as well. Case, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, so in terms of selecting the uh, which attorneys to audit, um, uh, obviously, the, the uh, you know, California is not is not collecting information for all of those um, attorneys at this point. So you're not going to be able to use the data like LSA is in determining which law firms to audit. However, once you have selected which law firms to audit based on what is a relatively simple in comparison thing to do is create a self-assessment, something they can all fill out. Once they fill that out, you select a subset. At that point, it would be very beneficial, especially from a cost perspective, to have analytics designed so that when you request information and, and your requests are gonna be prescribed, we need trust transactions in exactly this manner, you can take those uploads, run them through analytical scripts and produce something on the other side, which targets you to these transactions, these rules that have been broken um, and allows your auditors to really narrow their focus. Otherwise, what you're going to end up with, especially for 15,000 law firms or whatever, is essentially a whole army of staff analyzing spreadsheets and analyzing them different amongst this auditor, or this auditor. So although the program in its entirety can't look at all the data because there's no prescribed model for that in, in the state of California yet, um, you can still build a model and use it for those uploads. And then eventually, you know, when you get there, require those uploads for everyone and do your risk-based sampling based on that. But just wanted to make that distinction. Thank you. Yeah. It's really um, helpful. And I, I, I too want to thank you guys for your incredible amount of information and your great uh, practice uh, of, of, of skills and work you're doing here uh, with your, uh, your public protections. Um, it's clear that we have a lot to learn and, and I'm very impressed by both the combination of the data that is you know, required to be submitted annually from all attorneys, as well as the skill you've developed in terms of analyzing that data <clears throat> and then picking um, you know, high risk or high uh, um, interest uh, attorneys to perform audits on. I think that is exactly the right model. It's if I'm using your your lean resources most efficiently as possible. I do have a, a, a day job in the tax world though. So I will just put one plug in for random audits. Um, there are plenty of uh, individuals out there who can submit data and either, uh, you know, but it can be full of errors or not necessarily 100% accurate. It can still look perfectly normal and nice. And maybe it was deliberately, um, you know, inaccurate or it was mistakenly inaccurate. But sometimes you'll never find those folks uh, through just a you know a look see as to whether things look okay or not, um, unless you pick a few. 
and, and do some randoms. And I will say that uh, the fear that, that someone could get a random, no matter how good a job they're doing, does continue to be a good incentive to encourage and actually uh, deliver uh, more compliance in most uh, communities because everyone's fearful of an audit. And the fact that they, uh, they know that one could happen uh, at any time is, is sometimes a good thing to have. Um, and then the last thing I will ask is, um, I was impressed by your ability, you said, um, Chioma, to freeze uh, client trust accounts. Um, and maybe this isn't a question for you, but rather for Randy or where, somewhere later in our meeting. But I'm curious as to uh, whether uh, California State Bar has that power or if it could develop it if it doesn't. Anyway, I, I was impressed by that as well. Um, Leah, Richard, I don't know if there's anything else we need from our guests, but I think this has been a fantastic session. Yeah, no, I agree. I asked you if you would send us your mocked up slide, because I think, um, Jose, I was suggesting maybe we take a brief break right now. And then when we come back, we can dig into like, well, what do we want to do here in, in California? Um, and so it would be great to have your slide to integrate into that Chioma. But I think maybe a five minute break or 10 minute break, and then we could segue into talking about our own program. That sounds great. Let's take a 10 minute break. I see that it's a nearly 1.30. Why don't we all convene back here at 1.40 in 10 minutes? Thanks everyone. Thanks Thank folks. you. Thanks, Thank everyone. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's see if we let's see if we can get everyone back and we'll continue our conversation. Um, so I'm not sure that we're getting Mark back. It sounded like he was leaving at 1.15. Okay. Um, Highland, I know, had to get on a call. She was coming back. Okay. But I don't know that she's coming back right now. So perhaps if we can get Sean back, we'll just go ahead and get going. That sounds good. Sorry, everyone, I'm back. Okay, great. Okay, let's go. Okay, so Louisa, is she doing um, the PowerPoint? And I don't actually see her. Uh, oh, there you are. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. I did not get the slide from Chioma. I don't know if you did, Richard. Uh, yes, she sent it just, uh, just a bit ago. Oh, wait, she forgot to attach it. Now she did. So 441, a minute ago. Okay, all right. So we'll, we'll integrate that into the presentation, but Louisa, if you could um, go ahead and put up the slides. We'll Everyone can see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, great. All right, well, after that uh, very inspiring uh, presentation of Alberta, uh, it's time for us to take another look at these elements to uh, again, try, uh, sketch out, uh, how California might begin uh, its own proactive client trust account um, management program. So if we can go to the first slide. So we talk about some of the elements again, and we have some uh, <clears throat> proposals based on our discussion last time, talk about those elements. Uh, and then at, at the end, as we've done before, look at the meeting uh, roadmap work plan uh, for the committee. So moving to the next slide. All right, so the first two elements, which are really baseline, uh, are annual registration and annual certification. So annual registration uh, is simply what it says, the registration 
of all client trust accounts with the information regarding the account number, financial institution, uh, and it's also an opportunity for uh, attorneys to say they do not have responsibility for a client trust account and they and thereby and, and thus the bar would know uh, what is the universe uh, that first number that um, is required and as they as the old saying goes you can't manage what you can't measure so this is the first step toward getting some measurement of the number of these accounts where they're held where they're located uh, to begin to, to wrap arms around uh, client trust accounts. And the second piece of that is a, is a very simple uh, attestation of compliance with uh, rules and statutes pertaining for those attorneys who do have responsibility for them to also uh, affirm that they are in compliance. It's a very simple statement, but again, every time we do this, it's a way to reinforce the message that uh, they are responsible to know this and to be uh, adhering to it. Um, so very simple process that would be both of these integrated into the annual license renewal process that uh, attorneys do online. So that's these are the first two elements um, that we were suggesting be foundational to uh, whatever form the program takes beyond this. Um, so Leah, do you want to, should we run through the whole thing and then come back or how would you like to proceed or Jose? I like going through the whole thing and uh, then we'll take a look at it. Okay. All right. So we can move then to the next slide. All right. So we have a couple of options and uh, Chioma shared option three, uh, which you got a brief look at uh, a few minutes ago. So uh, option one has to do with compliance reviews, I believe. No. So there's, a, there's an intermediate uh, uh, initial step, which we're calling self-assessment, which is not showing up here, but self-assessment would be uh, a self-report by attorneys who are responsible for client trust accounts that indicates that they are, it, it's in a sense, a more detailed affirmation of uh, compliance with key components. And there's some examples from not only Alberta, but uh, from other states that we would be able to borrow from. And it's, these are <clears throat> largely checklist uh, items. Um, you know, each client trust account has its own individual ledger, client ledger, yes, no, uh, client uh, accounts and checks, uh, uh, deposits uh, are correctly labeled. Uh, all of the requirements for which are spelled out in California is a very detailed handbook for client trust accounting, which the bar distributes. So in other words, a series of key statements uh, that would provide additional basis. And I think Casey said it best in the, in the end of his last remarks, one would wanna design this with some notion of not just a random sort of things that are being firm, but some that are tied to uh, our best understanding of <clears throat> probable risk which would of course be refined over time. Then uh, <clears throat> there would be a random, uh, in, in this option, there's a random selection of attorneys to do, uh, to secure uh, compliance reviews, which are yet a further enhanced examination of these accounts by an outside uh, auditor. And, and here's where the bar would need to, work with uh, auditors uh, to develop a set of standards that are, that are in line with the requirements uh, of the bar because those are not identical to uh, the, what's known as generally accepted accounting principles that an auditor might use in just a standard financial audit of, a, of some corporate books. So that would be a required piece there. Then those get submitted to the bar for review and analysis and follow up uh, based on findings. So key issue here is the random uh, selection for a compliance review. We go to the next slide. 
So the difference here is that compliant, you know, again, there's a, to the, on the left-hand side, you would see a little box saying self-assessment. So again, that would be done by all attorneys. And, and this, this is the universal model. So all attorneys do that compliance, uh, that self-assessment. All attorneys uh, do the detailed compliance review. And then there is an audit based on a random sample of those. And again, this would be based on uh, our best sense of probable risk. And, and that, again, that would evolve over time as the data uh, are accumula accumulate and can serve as the empirical basis for, for that. Um, the, okay. Sorry, then there's two variants in that uh, audit piece, which are whether uh, the audits are conducted by state bar audit staff or whether they are conducted by outside CPAs, like, again, using the standards developed with the state bar. I will say that uh, because the question arose earlier, the one state with which I was able to discuss that does you Delaware, which uses outside accountants of CPAs for their audits, uh, they report that those generally on average cost about 2,500 US dollars, you know, more or less, you know, with a small range, depending on size of firm, but there's a lot of just fixed cost of doing it. So that's sort of the ballpark. I think that's a fair uh, ballpark idea. And, and then Chioma had sketched option three. Yes, if Louisa, you stop sharing your screen, I can um, share mine and I pulled up her slide here. So here she has the stuff, the pieces in red are uh, what she has added. So she added the label option three and she explained in that first self-assessment box that I was describing, uh, the need to get this detailed uh, information. And then in the middle piece, um, she was suggesting as she described uh, using a risk-based sample there, although acknowledged and we discussed uh, that this can be mixed and matched with random auditing as the program evolves. And then her label of the third box is not audit, but it's risk response of which audit is one piece. And she added this option about the possibility of freezing trust accounts uh, as part of that process. And, and those uh, responses obviously ra range from there are no deficiencies, file is closed, to minor, which are uh, either can be corrected in some states as done right on the fly during the audit. If the, the auditor discovers this check should have been deposited over here, um, they report those findings, but they, they don't wait to fix them. And then there's others where they are reported and fixed. And if more substantively than a more detailed project plan for how to fix those. Anyway, and it gradually moves up uh, the ladder. Uh, and depending on what is found in the compliance review and the self-assessment, uh, it might jump straight to a referral for investigation and possible discipline. But it, all these programs do stress, I will say that primary function of these is, is, is to try to support the correct management of these accounts. Most of the errors are inadvertent, uh, uh, lack of oversight, lack of uh, paying attention to the rules and not out and out attempts to defraud clients. So, um, but obviously when that does happen, uh, even one of those is too many. So. Uh, there has to be a, a data-driven sense in the best case of, of where and how to find those things. Um, but the programs emphasize the proportionality of response and that not, a, a mere overdraft, while it's a risk factor, is not in and of itself a disciplinary matter. Um, so there's an administrative approach uh, to resolving it, but are really just simple accounting problems uh, in this, in these approaches. So those are three flavors of audit. Uh, the other components, which we talked about before, include support for attorneys through enhanced education uh, and 
as was, you know, through podcasts, focused e-newsletters, you know, topic driven based on issues that are surfaced in these reviews. Uh, there's a possible we could propose mandatory continuing legal education for attorneys who have responsibility for client trust accounts. I know there is work currently underway that Randy can speak to regarding a um, non-mandatory CLE uh, course content that's being developed. So that's a question whether mandatory or not and for whom. Um, and as uh, Alberta alluded to, it's also a matter of educating the accounting community uh, about this and bookkeepers in law firms and uh, and so on. So that, and, and as we also have discussed before, uh, educating the public about their, um, their rights, should they be involved in a legal matter, uh, what their rights as clients are to understanding their, how their money is being housed, maintained and reported back to them. Uh, so those are the key pieces. Um, so we want to circle back. Um, we can go from there. Yeah, I think, do you want us to take the slides down for discussion, Jose? Yeah. I mean, I think the real crux of it is the options one, two, or three. Yeah. Um, that's the heart of the discussion for today. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's great. And um, I will open it up for uh, committee members or anybody to comment on that. Uh, on those options. Um, I'll hold my comments for a bit, although I am a little partial to number three, but uh, <laughs> does anybody else have any comments or questions? I, so I'll just kick off by saying, given the bar's limited resources and how many folks we need to oversee, it. To me, it makes sense to take a risk-based approach rather than a totally random approach because that would seem to concentrate our resources where the risk is greatest. Can I ask um, Randy, you a question because I know you developed the self-assessment um, instrument that the board recently approved. Um, mm -hmm. Does that have a risk uh, component or aspect in its design, meaning the kinds of questions that are asked, uh, is there some tie to a risk analysis in the self-assessment as currently designed? Yeah, the uh, questions that we are uh, using to inspire the self-assessment aspect of the e-learning that have a self-assessment component, we really look towards the Colorado model, which was presented to the board some, some time ago, but many of those questions are geared towards the practice and compliance aspect as well as best practices. And so they are inquiring with the lawyer uh, what they are actually doing. And so, for example, there are standards on how to handle funds in dispute. You know, what are you supposed to do if you have a claimant or a lien holder or the attorney's own interests or prior attorney's interests in trust funds and it's disputed. And so while a typical e-learning course would uh, test your knowledge of well, what would be the rule or what's the uh, approach that ought to be taken, the self-assessment would ask you, are you really doing it? It's uh, really inquiring as to, have you ever held funds in dispute? Have, did you disperse them? And in what manner uh, uh, authorization did you use to disperse them? Uh, and that's how the self-assessment is different from the current e-learning initiatives that we have been doing. The one thing I'll say though, is that our current e-learning and self-assessment plan all begins as voluntary. And it's only when we're at the second wave of self-assessment course development. So we're, we're taking on the 10 courses that Colorado has, but that as each course is rolled out, we would then review the results of the performance of the attorneys who took it voluntarily to determine what would be the next level course to create. And if the performance, the information collected on those voluntary self-assessments suggests that there is some real great lack of knowledge or, or lack of appropriate practice as to some certain area or activity, then it would be for the board to consider whether that next level self-assessment course should be made mandatory for a certain population. 
but at the start, it would all be voluntary. But yeah, this would be a divergence from that. And let me ask Melanie, um, I don't think George, it's fair to put you on the spot with this question, but could we um, mine our misappropriation cases to develop any kind of risk profile akin to some of the things that you know Alberta had? Like, I, to my knowledge, we haven't done that. Um, do you think we have sufficient volume? Like, it's something we could do. Yeah, I definitely think Oriya would be able to look at things like <clears throat> um, practice area and firm size for sure. Okay. So it sounds to me like between um, a self, the creation of a self-assessment, maybe working from what Randy Shop has already done, but perhaps tweaking or modifying it for this context and doing a data analysis of our misappropriation cases, we could, Richard, you know, come up with some initial risk factors to maybe augment um, a random. Because even though Alberta's is, is risk-based, there were some elements that were not, right? New attorneys, if you hadn't been audited in 10 years. And I think that that's smart to have a mix. Yeah, they, they stratified their universe, if you will, and, and sort of that they didn't just rely on randomness, but there was focused uh, approach within that given their resources. And um, I noted that, you know, we also heard from Ontario before, and even though their risk factors may not have been and may not be sustained by the same level of data, nonetheless, their, their anal analysis of complaints and so on, it re uh, arrives at a profile which is very, very similar to Alberta's and frankly, as similar to law practices in the state. So, you know, small firms, solos, uh, real estate practices, estate practices, uh, and an interesting one, recent solo. So the, the phenomenon of an attorney leaving a firm as it sort of transitioned to full retirement, where they've never been responsible for this in a big firm. Now they're on their own, maybe out in a small town, and, and suddenly they're, they, have to, they have to be doing this. So they identified that as one kind of category. In addition to, to what Alberta was saying about matching up the self-assessment with the actual uh, data that they collected, and, and, as, uh, and obviously all of these also integrating complaint data. So yes, I think we could develop a preliminary set uh, and use that in con combination with random to create a meaningful uh, starting point. Great. Uh, Sean, go ahead. So, um, so Richard, let me ask you a quick question before I move on. Um, the, in the memo that was in the posted agenda materials, are options one and two there the same as options one and two on the slides? Okay, I just want to oh, confirm. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we had some version control issues here, but essentially the difference between one and two is that one relies on randomness from the beginning and, and two is what you, is the universal approach. So the, the missing piece in the slide I just showed was um, that first self-assessment. So whether everybody does it or whether it's random selection and then in the compliance review, whether everybody does it or whether that's also you know, part of that same random selection. I think that's the main difference. And option two includes an audit as um, a step and option one does it, just a compliance review. Yeah. There's something to be said for, uh, if it's just a self-assessment, having each attorney do that, unless they don't have anything to do with attorney trust account. And um, I think registration is kind of a no-brainer. That seems like something that we ought to start collecting that data. And then maybe I'm moving beyond what you want to talk about, but you know, I think we should look at uh, look, do implementing a program like Alberta's in terms of collecting that data and using algorithms to, to analyze it. Um, I don't think under our current funding structure, we could use internal auditors because if I'm doing my math right, then we have about 20 times more active lawyers than Alberta regulates. And so that would equate to about 180 <laughs> staff members, uh, which Leah, do we have the money for that? No, but I would say on funding, like we can't implement this without an additional assessment. 
Um, and I think that we just have to assume that that's how this would be implemented. We have, I think, a good opportunity to make the case for that with the audit that's coming again in the spring. The state auditor will be back here um, really specifically to look at, at trust account and, uh, and other issues. So I think it's a good time for us to put together a proposal, cost it out, and this would have to be funded via an additional assessment. There's we we can't absorb it, and I don't think we should suggest that we could. Yeah, I, I would add just one more thing. I would say I would agree with that, and but also I think another way to deal with the cost issue is to, you know, I'm not sure that we have to have every audit conducted by state bar staff. In fact, I'm inclined to think that's not the way to go. We would want to have a certain number of auditors on staff to oversee what's going on but i think we'd have to have the law firms pay for the cpa to audit it and i like the risk-based approach it sounds like it's very sensible um and um so that's going to take some time to implement not just the funding but you know for you know every single law firm in the state to get on a form of software that can do this reporting you know that's going to take some time to implement so we definitely need a two-tier approach. Like, what can we do now? What can we propose to do with additional funding? Great. Any other thoughts or questions? Just one quick comment on on the across the board registration requirement. I, I did uh, note in reviewing uh, Richard's great research and materials that there is a, a bit of a spectrum in terms of the actual registration forms that are used and something like the New Jersey form would request um, a great level of detail, including client names associated with funds on deposit uh, versus, you know, what we're doing right now with IOLTA accounts where, you know, those are common and segregated accounts. We don't try to track who the client is and California does have a strong sort of bias towards client confidentiality, privacy, and privilege. So I would imagine that in the registration initiative that we actually deploy, that we wouldn't want to know client identity or anything at that level until you progress to what would be a compliance review or audit stage, perhaps. Great. Good, good points. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I could just Thank say- you, um, yeah, just to add to that, yes, and I think most of the ones I've looked at are are pretty high level. It's it's the financial institution and the account number, just so that there's some reality to it. But client identity isn't relevant at that stage in terms of just counting who's got these and where are they. The other um, thing I would just add, because it was public information shared with Lee and I in a previous call, that the current contract that Alberta has with PricewaterhouseCoopers was in the uh, order of magnitude of about 200,000 US dollars. So that gives you a sense. I mean, obviously California is bigger and, uh, but the, I think Casey's point is a good one that you don't wanna begin by just kind of asking for like what seems to make sense and get this mountain of stuff that people can't really make heads or tails of only to then have to go back and go oh by the way we're not asking you to do all that you know we forget about what we said the first time now what we really want you to do is this because there's a huge cost to people to firms and attorneys of trying to set up to report one way only to be told within two years oh no 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 we really want to go this other way so it would behoove the bar to be very thoughtful about that initial uh compliance review data collection uh process yeah, I, I think I think I'll I think sorting out the order in, in, in doing things, taking uh, this kind of in steps and in stages is useful. And I think um, at least Leah, you've said a number of times, you know, we have this annual filing that every attorney does. And it doesn't take any software on the attorney's part, correct? They just go to our portal or whatever and do this filing. And so, you know, it it is. The definition of easy, right? To just add questions in that filing, no, no software, no lift on the attorney's part, but we should be able to gather a decent medium-sized amount of information, right? Maybe not a, a list of every single client trust account, but a yes, no, do you have 
client trust accounts, how many, you know, you know, some sort of question about balances, total balances in it, number of number of clients, number of accounts, um, things like that. So, because I think one of the things that I think, especially when we're going into a conversation that says we're going to need, you know, a certain number of dollars and to uh, to collect fees to cover that cost, we need a lot more information about the universe we're tackling and the uh, and better numbers to estimate costs with. And that we should be able to get right away just by asking additional questions in the, in the annual filing. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, I think you're talking about the IOL. I mean, the annual filing is the payment of the licensing fee. Right. And that coincides with the requirement, for example, to report on your IOLTA account, except I believe you're also, and Randy can confirm, supposed to report um, that on a running basis, whenever you make any changes, I'm not sure if it's just once a year, but we could certainly add to that just additional fields for non iota trust accounts. Um, right now, attorneys are not required to report that, and I don't believe, I, I don't know what it would take to just even initiate that step. And it's an interesting question if we want to fast track that piece of it simply to have an idea of the scale, because we know we have 50,000 IOLTA accounts. We have no idea how many non IOLTA trust accounts are out there. Zero. I think the other purpose of the data would be if the bar, if, if the committee's going to recommend that the bar uh, explore. Uh, a data-driven model with these kind of analytics, we're not going to be able to, you, the bar would not be able to issue a reason, a, a meaningful request for information or request, and then turn that into an RFP without giving prospective bidders some idea <laughs> of what they're being asked to bid on. Um, so is it, you know, is it 10,000? Is it 20? Like what's the capacity? I mean, in the sense, the data is the same, whether it's a thousand or 10,000, but the scale of it does matter in terms of the analytics and, and the normalization and cleaning of all that data that they referred to as a major challenge. So it's necessary for that purpose as well as a, as a foundation step toward a more sophisticated system. So I think Leah and Richard, you both su suggested that we should explore if the annual filing done by every attorney could have some added questions that would give us exactly those answers, Richard, that you just talked about? Yes, I think we can outline and bring back a, a, a what that looks like to the committee, um, not by next Monday, but by, you know, that the uh, later in the month and, and get us give a sketch of what that would look like. And I'll, I'll accompanied with this a sketch of the uh, most probable risk factors based on complaint data uh, that we have. Sean, is your hand up? No, sorry, that's old. Okay, Randy, can you um, opine as to like, let's say we wanted to implement this requirement for the upcoming billing cycle, which begins December 1. Um, and I'm also thinking in my head, but it's like a little jumbled. We did add new requirements to report, I believe, on your practice type. Um, we added some new requirements, practice area, is that ringing a bell with anybody? We did add those requirements um, shortly before I left, but I think they went into effect either this last January or this coming January. But my, my question is, what would need to be done to, to mandate attorneys to now report information on client trust accounts, even a bit to mandate a response to a basic question like, do you maintain client trust accounts, non-IOLTA client trust accounts? So I suppose it might depend on what uh, remedy the state bar might be looking for in terms of uh, non-compliance. And so there, there is the role of attorneys and the member records information that attorneys must submit Business and Professions Code section 6002.1. And then the duties of attorneys, uh, you know, uh, require that the attorney comply with uh, maintaining that information. And so if your member record, so to speak, information is amended to include what we're asking for in terms of trust account uh, reporting and certification of compliance, then it would fall into 
sort of that sort of bucket. It's now a, a membership a reporting requirement uh, covered by the State Bar Act and could in fact be a cause for discipline if, if the uh, attorney does not uh, comply. Um, there are things that are, that are less than that. They are just, I think, reflected in the State Bar rules. And I'm not sure of the effect of, of non-compliance with things that are simply in the state bar rules, but aren't really incorporated, so to speak, as to a professional responsibility. Uh, I think the idea is that um, we would chase after them to obtain their compliance, uh, but might not be uh, uh, a disciplinary uh, exposure for the attorney. Now, we don't necessarily have to go the route of statute. Uh, when we impose the requirement, for example, of an email address to be used for state bar purposes, again, sort of part uh, parcel of the attorney so-called member records requirement, that was actually codified in the California Rules of Court. So it's in Rule of Court 9.9, .9, where we have the online reporting uh, standard, and that one includes the email address. That one is not in the uh, statutory uh, uh, member records requirements. So I, I think there are options, but I think it's really driven by how clear do you want this to be in terms of the uh, remedy for non-compliance. And I just found what I was talking about. So it was amended effect. It's rule 2.2 .2 of the rules of the state bar um, effective December 1, 2020, and now requires attorneys to report on professional website if one is maintained practice sector law firm size and any additional jurisdiction admission. So that was done by a rule of the state bar as you referenced, um, Randy. I don't know that we could do that fast enough for this billing cycle because there is a requirement to go out for public comment. That would need to happen at the November board meeting. But certainly um, we do have a vehicle that we control to at least require the submission of information to give us a sense of the universe that's out there. That, that sounds like an important first step to me. And again, uh, I thought that I heard, and pardon me for not being close to a lot of this stuff, but I thought I'd heard that there are state laws that require any attorneys handling client trust accounts to have certain practices and safeguards in place, and there is discipline if they don't follow those. Isn't that correct, Randy? Uh, the rules of professional conduct uh, state the basic requirements for maintaining a client trust account, and they even include authority for the, the Board of Trustees to adopt record keeping standards, which uh, we do have in California and which are published with the rule itself. And so those do set the, the basic fiduciary responsibilities with regard to handling of client funds and property. Um, I wouldn't say they're super detailed, except to the extent that we do have the record keeping requirements that set up the three part uh, reconciliation practice that is required for the client trust accounts. You get more detail in the client handbook on client trust accounting, um, but that isn't really a, a, a law per se. It's more of the guidelines for discharging those record keeping obligations. But again, forgive me, if you don't follow record keeping, if you don't handle your client trust accounts well, there are rules that um, impose discipline or there are yes. not. You, you'd be subject to discipline. Rule 1.15 is a rule of professional conduct, the violation of which would subject the attorney to discipline. Great. And I'm guessing, Melanie, your hand's up because you might want to reinforce that. Right. Well, that's true. I also wanted to go back to Randy's point about thinking about <clears throat> what the potential goal and sanction would be for not complying with reporting requirements. And my suggestion is to think about <clears throat> if you it's one thing to have discipline as a potential um, outcome for non-reporting, but um, if you want to gain quicker compliance, my suggestion is to think about an administrative suspension um, for non-compliance because it gets people's attention much quicker. It's much faster to actually do um, than actually it being reported to the discipline system and going through the entirety of that process. Interesting. Yeah, and I think that's um, one of the things we had on the slide because it was um, perhaps one of the responses that we saw Richard found in Alberta or elsewhere, the administrative suspension. 
if we could go back to our model. So I think we are talking about um, as a very initial phase, getting a sense of the universe of attorneys that are responsible for client trust accounts. That's like really step one. Mm -hmm. Step two is require, requiring an annual registration and certification related to client trust accounts. And the, the registration would be all of your accounts, meaning the account numbers and the institution. The certification, yes, I certify I'm compliant with rule 1.15. Then also in that phase two, we would implement a self-assessment. This would be mandatory for anybody who indicates they're responsible for management of a client trust account, right? And that self-assessment would be developed or modified from what we've already developed to ensure that it had a risk component in there. Also as part of phase two behind the scenes, we would be looking at our misappropriation cases to um, identify risk factors so that we've starting to begin a risk profile. And then, so then that's step phase two. And then like maybe phase three is compliance, uh, compliance reviews required for select group of attorneys and potential responses to that would include audits, would include all kinds of things, supervision, looking at the ability of whether we could freeze accounts, all of that. So maybe like a three phase approach. The first one is just the universe of what's out there. The second is registration and self-assessment. The third is where we begin compliance reviews and auditing. Does that sound right to me? And it also sounds like you really want us to um, start, and I think this is smart. I just think it's gonna be interesting to see the reaction, but to focus on um, data-driven and automated uh, approaches. So all of our tools are online, our data upload, we have uh, automated data upload requirements. We're using data analytics to inform our work. We're not taking paper, we're not reviewing any Excel sheets that people send to us. Okay. All sounds good. So we. Jose, I have a. I, yeah, go I'm ahead. Sorry, Leah, I've actually got a question on that last point. So, the fact that you raised it the way you did, Leah, um, suggests to me that there might be um, some resistance or some trouble in moving to that sort of system. Um, is it simply because we have so many licensees, a significant portion of which are, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but just older and not real adept at technology, what's the, I sense a hurdle. Oh, well, I think this whole thing is gonna be a hurdle. I mean, one of the things we really need to think about is how to socialize the fact that we're doing this. Cause you know, we don't have any public comment. I'm not sure that this is really, you know, on people's radar. I think it's gonna be a highly controversial set of um, recommendations. Although, you know, when you see that other states are doing it, when you learn about something like Alberta, you kind of feel like, why in the world haven't we been doing this? It's sort of an obvious thing that you need to do. But I think it's going to be very controversial. So I think when you start requiring data uploads, then you get to the Alberta piece of you've got to use a certain software packages. You, you start being more and more intrusive, right, or, or directive in how you accomplish it. And, you know, Chioma was very transparent with us. Like she said with you, like really if they could use one software package and have it really align with their data fields, it would be a lot easier than this free choice among 12. But things like that are never received well because we're a free country, you know, that kind of stuff. So anyway, yeah, <laughs> I think it's, it's gonna be interesting. For sure, Sean? And what you say, Leah, um, it is going to be a challenge. And, you know, it, it, I could see some um, practitioners who have, who maintain a trust account, but let's just say it's very, very small, like only for whatever reason, just a few transactions a year, just a few clients, or maybe even one client. And that when we get to implementing something like this, um, and in fact, even for people who aren't tech savvy, that we see if we can arrange a group of accountants who can provide the service of taking a paper ledger 
and putting it in a format that's acceptable to the vendor, which could be, I would hope they would have an option for, you know, a simple Excel spreadsheet. They would set up a spreadsheet and you can take your data from a ledger and put it in there. And that would be useful to people who have, you know, whatever, less than 20 transactions. They might prefer that instead of setting up a whole accounting system and everything. So I think there are solutions, um, but, you know, as a profession, I just think we have to get behind this because, um, I mean, I've said variations on the theme of this before. It's just, it's very shameful that a very small number of attorneys steal from their clients. And sometimes on a scale of magnitude, that is astonishing. And I know we've already heard people complain that um, the lawyers who are innocent and honest, which is the majority of lawyers in this area, I think, the vast majority, you know, why should they have to suffer for this? Why should they have to be inconvenienced? Why should they have to incur costs? And I think it's just part of being a part of a profession like this where our clients keep impose trust and confidence. And, and part of that is um, we have to sort of contribute like to the client security fund. We have to kind of contribute to cleaning up some messes that the very few among us who are dishonest create. It's just part of our responsibility in my opinion. Sean, I just want to echo exact everything you're saying. And I must confess that over the course of the conversation today, I've really begun to frame this in my mind as not the client trust account audit program, not the client trust account management program, but this is really the client trust account protection program that we're building here. We are about protecting client funds. And we best do that by making sure that every attorney most of whom, to your point, Sean, are not trying to do anything inappropriate or especially illegal, but rather just are maybe not as well informed, not as well trained, not as well practiced as they need to be to do a good job of being an escrow, cash financial escrow agent, which is not a trivial thing to be. And this program is all about, as I think we kept hearing over and over again from our neighbors in Canada, that it's mostly about training people. It's about getting them just to put down stuff, information down on paper so that they have a memory jogged at least once a year that says, oh, yeah, I've got 19 client trust accounts and half of them I haven't touched in four years. Gee, I wonder if I'm doing the right thing with those. This is just maybe as simple as that, but it is at the end of the day, a client trust account protection program fulfilling the, the, the goals of the state bar and the state law to protect all clients in California. And I think we should beat that drum because it's the truth. Anything else? Um, small historical note and then a, a comment on the technology issue. So in, in previous work for the bar, discovered that the very first bar was set up in New York State precisely to delineate the honest lawyers from the <laughs> Tammany Hall lawyers. And so the whole function of the bar was to rehabilitate the profession, which had shamed its, you know, had, had shamed itself, and and there was even one state, which slightly later on its way to statehood, attempted to embed in their state constitution a prohibition against any lawyer residing in their state. So, and it sounds <laughs> funny, but it shows you the level of popular anger actually against the free wheeling stuff. So now, fast forward to today where there's this lawyers took upon themselves this self-regulation and they practice a great deal of it. Um, but to do that and maintain that trust is a huge obligation that needs to be met professionally. On the technology question, I, I would also just try to put this in the context of other things happening in the legal world. So for example, in the state of Texas, electronic filing is required in every single case by everybody, which is why Texas could continue to function after the hurricane while Florida crashed in the courts because of these land-based servers that drowned. So, so it's a matter of how that's done and bringing people along and giving people tools. So they built a, they did build a software piece. They said, you can use this free or you can use whichever one you want as long as it can do what it needs to do. And, uh, because it's a free country, as Leah said, a lot of lawyers continue to just pay whoever they were paying to do it instead of using the free tool. Doesn't matter as long as everybody got it in. So, um, 
So I think in the legal world in general, there are, there, there are examples of increasing move toward this that of which this would be a piece. Doesn't mean it should be ignored as an issue because I agree, especially since one of the risk uh, factors in many states are older attorneys. So that, that is a, an issue that has to be uh, understood and examined as this goes forward for sure. Great. Okay, I think we, we have enough to work with to develop kind of a recommendation from this committee to the full board. Um, and we'll wanna work closely with you, Randy, to figure out kind of the how we might achieve some, some of the, the phases from a rules perspective. Um, I, yeah, I think we, I think we, I'm trying to think if we need Richard, anything else from this group. I was only going to say at some point, I think we will need to do um, an RFQ uh, request for quotes um, to get a sense of what it might cost us to use um, a Pricewaterhouse or a Deloitte for some of that analytics as well as to outsource the auditing. Um, if we were going to do that, Sean, as opposed to having attorneys just find their own auditor and pay them, we could also outsource auditing. So we'll, we'll, I think we'll need to build that into our work plan. Um, but we need the total number of the universe before we can even get a request for quotes going. OK. So our next topic for today is um, malpractice insurance. I don't know if you want to take another quick break, Jose. Um, we have really only a very brief um, closed session update. So we don't have much time to spend on that. And I did want to spend a few minutes at the um, end of open session going over the calendar for our remaining couple of meetings. But other than that, the malpractice piece is the bulk of the Okay. So do you want to take a break or do you want to just move right into it? What What are people's desires? So if we, uh, our quorum is four people, right? If one of us drops, we've lost a quorum. Uh, I think our quorum is three. It's three. Three? It doesn't sound like we're going to be voting on anything. Right. Today. Okay. All right. Okay, um, I, would, drop, I, would, I would favor a five minute break. Let's do a five minute break. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm actually going to drop off now, guys. Okay, thanks, thanks. Randy. I, okay. Bye. I have 231. Let's be back at 236. Thanks, everyone. We are now recording. Thank you, Louisa. Uh, Leah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll turn it over to Linda, um, and she's just going to give a brief overview of our most recent effort to explore the issue of mandatory malpractice insurance. So Linda, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, so the background to this was, and I'm not sure how many of the members of the board uh, were around back then, but in 2017, the fee bill that was passed directed the state bar to conduct, conduct a study regarding several aspects of malpractice insurance. So in February of 2018, the board uh, of trustees adopted a charter and appointed members to a working group, the malpractice insurance working group, which met seven times as a full working group between March 2018 and February 2019, with many, many subcommittee meetings in between all of those uh, meetings. The charge of the working group was to uh, review, research and review and report back on the following topics. Uh, the first one is the adequacy, availability, and affordability of insurance measures for encouraging attorneys to obtain and maintain insurance, recommended ranges of insurance limits that would protect pub the public, the adequacy of the rule requiring uh, attorneys to disclose whether if they do not have insurance, and also the, the big one was the advisability of mandating insurance for all licensed attorneys. So there were recommendations and, and findings on all of these topics. And um, Ruben, I'm not sure if you're here, uh, if you're back, but Ruben was on this working group. So if you have anything to add, um, that would be really helpful. But 
so I'll just go through the findings for each of those topics. In terms of adequacy, availability, and affordability of insurance, what was found was that California has a competitive insurance market and attorneys are able to find insurance. There was a time when um, that it was a harder market, but that's not the case, at least when this was done. And I think it continues to be the case that insurance is available. In terms of affordability, that's really subjective. And there was a, a lot of difference of opinion on that. And it depends on the firm size and, and um, what the relative cost was. And cost really depends partly on the uh, geography and, and where you're located in the state. And it partly depends on the um, area of practice that you're in. So in terms of measures for encouraging attorneys to obtain and maintain insurance, the big recommendations were to that the state bar should retain professional communications firm to conduct education campaigns directed at lawyers to educate them about the benefits of insurance coverage and the risks of lack of coverage and directed at the public to conduct an education campaign about the benefits of hiring an insured lawyer and the risks of hiring an uninsured lawyer. There was also a recommendation that uninsured lawyers be required to complete a free loss avoidance program that includes educational tools and self-assessments to ensure effective practice management and risk reduction. And this was modeled on a program in Illinois that's in place in Illinois. And Illinois attorneys are required if they don't to report whether they have malpractice insurance. And if they don't, they have to undertake a, a self-assessment. The recommendations regarding ranges of insurance limits, uh, what was uh, recommended is that if legal malpractice insurance were to be required, that coverage of 100,000 per occurrence and 300,000 adequate per year is reasonably sufficient protect, to protect members of the public who are served by attorneys who are not uh, currently insured. And one of the key findings was that virtually all of the mid to large firms, well, all of the large firms are, have malpractice insurance and pretty much um, all of them, uh, firms of 10 or more attorneys are insured. There is um, between the attorney firms between like five and 10, most of them, I'd, I think it was maybe like 10 or 12%, I'd have to go back and look at the specific data, were uninsured, and about 30% of solo practitioners are uninsured. And so in terms of the risk, they are the, their clients, the clients who hired these really solo practitioners and very small firm attorneys, uh, the exposure isn't that high in terms of how much their losses might be. And that's where this 100,000, 300,000 coverage was determined to be adequate. They looked at the role of the, the adequacy of the disclosure rule. And I, I imagine you all know that attorneys are required to disclose to their clients if they are not insured. Um, they, that there's not any specific rules about when they have to disclose it. And a lot of times they disclose that at the time the, the, the client is signing a contract, signing a retainer agreement. And at, at that point, it, usually a client has gone pretty far down the line of deciding that they're gonna hire the attorney. And so to find somewhere, and it might be buried somewhere in the agreement that the attorney's not insured to then back out is pretty unlikely at that point with what they've invested in that decision. So the recommendations with regard to the rule was that the state bar should improve the model disclosure language that's provided in the rule. Um, that information about the attorney's lack of insurance should be included as part of their public profile. And in, in order to facilitate that, that attorneys should be required to report on their annual licensing statement uh, regarding whether they are insured and that the state bar should educate lawyers and the public about um, a malpractice insurance. And that ties back to the other recommendation. So the big topic had to, to do with whether uh, malpractice insurance should be required as a condition of licensing. And the working group did not, uh, they sort of punted on that. And they said additional research is needed. And the, the, and the research that should be done is what is the actual risk that's posed by attorneys who do not, do not car, uh, carry insurance. Um, 
whether attorneys who currently provide pro bono or low bono services would withdraw, withdraw from practice or reduce the pro bono or low bono portion of their practice if insurance were imposed. Um, the availability of insurance through legal aid groups and the limitations on obtaining insurance by working with these groups. Um, the rate of insurance for of coverage for California attorneys by firm size and the potential availability of lower cost options to encourage attorneys who do not currently buy insurance to do so. And so if we get to the reasons, the stated reasons why uh, there was not, not a recommendation to require insurance. What, what we kept hearing is there's no evidence of harm. Where are all of these people who there, who hired an attorney who committed malpractice and weren't able to find, um, and weren't able to sue them or weren't able to get a recovery because presumably if the attorney is not insured, you could still sue them for malpractice and then collect, you know, some other means, you know, their other assets. The problem that we found, and this is, this is, uh, in, in a lot of the literature and the research that's been done is that you can't find these people because um, lawyers who handle malpractice cases, at least experienced lawyers who handle malpractice cases, will not take a case against an attorney who's uninsured. The, the, these cases are very expensive and challenging to pursue and to prove. And it's just the, the likelihood of collecting on them if they, if, um, even if you did, did prevail is really hard. Attorneys often, if they're not insured, it's because they have found a way to protect their assets, um, even if they were to lose a malpractice claim. So, um, and in fact, when we, we did a survey of attorneys and a lot of them, that's part of what they reported that there's nothing, I don't need to insurance because I won't get sued or my assets are protected and there's not really any be benefit to me to incur that cost. Um, the, there were arguments that it would increase the cost of practice for solo and small practitioners and firm practitioners and that these costs would be passed on to their clients. Uh, we did some analysis of this and found that for an attorney that who billed 2.4 hours, uh, hours per day, and this was based on Clio data. Uh, so for an attorney um, who billed 2.4 hours per day, if they had to pay a $5,000 annual premium, they would have to increase their rates by $9 per hour. And we did a survey during the course of this uh, malpractice insurance working group. Uh, we did a survey by the um, NORC conducted a survey, which found that 72% of respondents would, and this was just uh, the general public, found that they, they would uh, vote in favor of a law mandating an, uh, malpractice insurance if it would result in an increase of $10 per hour. So that's 72%. And, if it would and then they were asked if it would re result in an increase of $30 per hour, 60% still said that they would vote in favor of such a law. Um, and there was also a concern about attorneys not being able to provide pro bono services if they had to take on this cost. Um, and that really boils down to the question of how are people providing pro bono services. So if they're providing pro bono services on their own, which most often is to um, relatives, uh, neighbors, friends, then that might be the case. But for pro bono work that's done through legal services programs, those programs all have insurance that covers the work that's done um, through their um, through their programs. So what the report, I just wanna quote something from, from the report, getting back to this question about uh, finding evidence of the harm. And what, what, it, what it says in the report is quantifying the financial harm suffered by victims of uninsured lawyers who can malpractice is especially prob problematic because those claims are rarely pursued. However, Professor Leslie Levin, using data from an analysis of indemnity payments, 
made to resolve claims against insured solo practitioners and firms from between two and five lawyers, projected that tens of millions of dollars would be paid annually to clients of uninsured lawyers nationwide if only they were insured. And, 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 I'm, and I'm glad to see that, you should, that you're here now, Ruben, because I would love to get your thoughts on this as well. My sense is that really the reason that there was not a recommendation to require insurance is that the, rec the objections came from solo and small firm practitioners who don't want to be forced to buy insurance. Um, and they really, a lot of the objections that we saw in the public comments is the state bar really doesn't have any business imposing any more regulatory requirements on attorneys. That really was the gist of the argument. I don't know, Ruben, if you have any different thoughts or perspectives as be, having been a member of this working group. So you're taking me, taking me back to the past a little bit. Um, yeah. And I'm not going to say I have PTSD, but there, there is a little bit of... Um, there is a little bit of a recognition of those those two points. Um, there was quite a bit of uh, resistance from small firms or solo practitioner representatives, um, principally on cost. Right? It was you know, I, a, a lot of it was like it's very expensive to buy this insurance, um, and we don't know you know how effective it's going to be. Um, the general notion of the state bar sort of you know going too far or getting deeper into the weeds. It, it was there as well. I'm, I, mean, I don't, I, I don't remember it being, I don't remember it being as um, prevalent or as strong as the cost issue, but I could have just blocked it out of my memory, Linda. <laughs> yeah, but, but really the, the key thing was that they, what people kept coming back to was there's no evidence of harm. And the problem is that it's really hard to find the evidence of harm when you're not going to find lawyers to even file these lawsuits. So what, what ends up happening is you have all these people who are harmed and have no recourse. Linda, um, I'm not sure whether this is terribly relevant to the discussion here today um, or whether you went over it, but there was quite a bit of uh, debate and discussion of disclosure requirements versus mandatory purchase requirements. You know, I don't, I don't know if it has any germanity to our, our discussion in this context of the, um, our current issue, but that was, a, that was an issue as well. It's like, you know, which jurisdictions require disclosure of um, uh, a lack of malpractice insurance, for example. Linda, you, you mentioned there were recommendations to that effect, and I just can't remember, like, did we implement any of those recommendations? They were not implemented. So the board got the recommendations and just and decided not to do do it. Right. Okay. I mean, I what I would, would, I would, I would, would I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. This was Ruben, for example, to put on the attorney profile. Have malpractice insurance does not. And, I mean, I would say it was a really different board. 2017, we had not yet separated the sections. It just happened July, January 1, 2018. It, to me, you know, it's difficult as a regulator. Sorry for this really weird lighting I have. I'm just like in the twilight zone over here. But anyway, as a regulator, it's really difficult to justify not mandating it, frankly, especially because the cost points that we were able to identify are pretty low. We, we're a huge market and we are a, an attractive market for an insurer. So, and, um, and, and I just wanted to, if I can point out the limitations of just the disclosure, even having the information on the website, there's a couple of things. One is that, um, you know, how frequently do people who are hiring uh, the solo and small firm practitioners go to the state bar's website to look up information. And the second is because of the nature of malpractice insurance, there are claims made policies. So even if it, it says at the time that the person hires the attorney that they were in, insured, by the time a claim is filed, they may not be insured. So even if they were insured at the time the malpractice incurred, was it, uh, occurred, it's not really relevant um, if that policy lapses. So that's where really a mandating insurance is, is a better solution.
So this is a topic for your committee to consider. It, the issue has obviously already been fully vetted by a state bar committee. And so my personal view is we don't need to kind of further study it. The, the question on the table is, is now the time to consider either mandating malpractice insurance or at least moving forward some of the other recommendations, although Linda um, indicates there are shortcomings with those. But, you know, it's, uh, I think that's the question. So a couple couple thoughts. Um, Leah's, one of Leah's last points about it's a different board today than it was when the malpractice insurance working group finished its work um, it is, is, is true, obviously. Um, and at the same time, it, it was, was 2018 when that report was presented to the board. 2019, it was March of 2019. Okay, 19, which, you know, which is not, I mean, that we were already well into the separation by then, right? Um, and the report went to the legislature, if I'm not mistaken, right? Because it was mandated by the legislature. So if, if we're going to, um, if we're going to recommend that the board take it up again, I think that we would have to find some ways to, you know, to really differentiate what's in that report and what that working group already did using, you know, using some, for lack of a better word, compelling evidence. Now, maybe, you know, maybe the, you know, the high profile incidents of the recent past are compelling enough. Um, but I think, you know, it's a conversation probably that needs to be further had. That makes sense. Yeah, Ruben, I would just say I agree with everything you're saying, but I really am still very much, um, it's on my mind a lot, the, as you call it, the recent uh, terrible events of the recent past. And what I think those showed us is that we have some real bad actors and we have a whole lot of client protection that we need to consider increasing. And I think this is the moment to bring those topics up if need be again and revisit them if need be again and say, given what we know now that we didn't know then, would we make a different decision? So I don't know if it's as simple, Leah, as just having the staff bring that full report. But this committee just recommend that 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 not obviously not redoing the, the committee's work, but just revisit the report again at the full board. That could be one approach. Revisit the recommendations. I mean, I, I do think Ruben is right. There's a, a political reality to this and everything that we're doing, right? So that certainly needs to be assessed as well. Well, some members of the of the board and the staff do dialogue with but members of the legislature. And that's what I was, that's what I was gonna suggest. Why don't we vet this, try and vet this out um, with, you know, a few key stakeholders and see whether it, you know, see whether it gets any traction. Okay. But that will require sort of refamiliarizing ourselves um, with the work, working group's report um, and maybe even the, the board, um, the board debate or the board discussion where you know we ultimately decided not to go any further. Sean, okay. Sean has memories too. Sean. Actually, I don't. I actually don't remember the board discussion on this. So it shows you the life span of the half life of my memory capacity. Um, I was just going to suggest, uh, really, uh, Lennon, your discussion of the evidence issue. It seems to me. I mean, we're never going to get hard statistics, but. The group of lawyers who specialize in bringing plaintiffs malpractice claims is pretty small. Um, I mean, they are sometimes brought by non-experts. I used to defend these cases um, uh, 
and and you're right about how complex they are. So people who weren't expert in the field really got over their head very quickly. But um, you know, I could put you in touch with one of them who could in turn put you in touch with the rest of them. And at least you could we could get a sense from them. Is it, you know, how common is it that a client, potential client, brings a case to you that you think is meritorious? So they're not going to have worked it up all the way. And legal malpractice cases need more workup than the typical case for a good practitioner. But they would have a sense like, yeah, I had, a, you know, I see that, you know, I see, oh, I see it once a year, I see it twice a year. It happens all the time. I mean, that would be some useful information. You know, once a year would indicate it's not a huge problem. It happens all the time. It's more compelling that there is a problem. The, and that's the kind of research that was done, that was referred to in the report. We, we didn't do this here, but it was done elsewhere. Um, what, what did they find from that? They found, they found that, that attorneys don't. And the thing is, they're, attorneys are not, what, what was part of what was found is that they're really not likely to be forthcoming and saying that, you know what? It seems like a good case, but I'm not going to pursue it. They they couch it in other ways. They don't they don't come right out and say I'm not going to take this case because the likelihood of recovery is small. They don't say that to their clients. They yeah. did they they did share that in some of the research that was done. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the one of the books that was uh, cited. Where they did do that kind of research, but it was kind. Of, it really, and this was a part of what was recommended was to do this more in-depth research, um, and that would re require, like, to, to do the kind of research. You don't necessarily want to do just anecdotal. I call these few people. You really would want to do a more serious research, and develop a methodology for doing that research. Conceivable. I mean, the, legal malpractice is now a certified specialty mm -hmm. by the state bar, and so that would be that would be an excellent source group. And you could provide them maybe if 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 they're. I, I'm not sure that in it being interviewed by the bar, they'd be cagey about this. I could see with a client being a little mm -hmm. more reserved, okay. potential client, but you could also provide anonymous surveys to that whole group. Right. So it doesn't have to be for attribution. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so I'm hearing, you know, Jose, like a strong interest in bringing this forward. Um, Sean, I think you're talking about a bit of a more um, measured approach, but maybe we would actually pursue trying to collect some of the data that was identified as being an obstacle to moving this forward. Um, we're also talking about like doing a pulse check with our key legislative stakeholders. I mean, I think it would make sense to bring back the report, the recommendations, and kind of summarize the recommendations, what was or was not implemented. I think mostly nothing was implemented. Um, and maybe we could just have some discussion at the board level about next steps and maybe it is sean for now like getting some more data like advancing at least some aspect of this by trying to get some better information um while we have those yeah. kind of conversations with stakeholders i totally agree with that i would to i would support bringing this forward again i think that especially given recent events board members are going to have ideas about other information they think would be helpful um you know, what amount of losses are we seeing or uninsured different ways of getting at that data. I think that would be compelling. And I apologize, I do have to drop for a call right now. We'll probably be done before you come back, so bye. Okay. Okay, um, do we have anything more on this topic? All right, Luis, are you available to put back up the PowerPoint? I'm not sure if she's there. Yes, I'm okay, here. Great. If you could just go to the timeline slides. Sure. Sorry, one second. I just need to pull it up.
All right. So we're here in um, in the, in the October twelfth meeting. If, if you could go forward. I sent a note to Jose before this meeting um, asking that we cancel our meeting next week um, because we simply have not had time to prepare. And I don't think our meeting on the 28th, that one topic is gonna take us two hours. So I'd like to push um, all of our remaining items to the 28th. There's these other conduct issues, which are, um, but included in the scope of your charter that we'll need to review and take a look at sort of what our existing rules are and authority to address. Um, there are other rule questions, just like some that came up today. Sean, you talked about attorneys who have the ability to maintain um, escrow funds that, you know, if, if you have any rule questions, I think the meeting that we would then have on the 28th would be the time to, um, suss those out so we could spend a few minutes now just making sure we can get them all out there. Um, also in the 28th, not on this slide, in the course of our work, Richard and I have come up with some other kinds of solutions or approaches that um, I think the committee may want to consider probably or certainly not for an immediate implementation, but something to think about. So I'd like to bring that, those forward on the 28th. One that is really top of mind given this um, conversation about escrow accounts is there, there are some places that are requiring um, attorneys to deposit settlement funds into escrow accounts maintained by third parties. And that kind of takes away uh, a, a, a lot of these issues if the attorney themselves no longer has responsibility or control over the funds. And so I'd like to just bring that forward so that we can know that we've looked at some of these other solutions. Again, I, I don't think that they are viable as short-term approaches for the bar necessarily. But my suggestion then is we cancel the 19th, we push the attorney conduct issues to the 28th, along with OCTC kind of training. Um, and that if there are other rule type issues that you want to make sure Randy is prepared to discuss, we name them now. And I think that's it. You can stop sharing, Louisa. Any thoughts, Sean, go ahead. Well, I'm like the driver who keeps the right turn signal on for three miles. I keep leaving my hand up. <laughs> so then, then when I try to raise it, it's not, not helpful. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, in response to your inquiry, um, uh, Leah, um, we have discussed previously the idea of, of amending the rule of professional conduct that requires lawyers to, quote, promptly pay out funds when the client becomes entitled to them to provide a more firm deadline, like 30 days or whatever. So we put that on our list. Okay. Any others? No? All right. All right. Okay. So I think um, we could go into closed session just for a couple minutes. That would be helpful. Okay. Louisa, have you sent, have we received a link? I just sent the link out. You should receive it shortly. Okay, if everyone could uh, access the closed session link, um, the, uh, the committee will go into closed session now um, as, uh, as allowed by uh, pursuant to government code section 11126A1 and 11126C2. Uh, the committee will be in closed session um, for a discussion, we'll come back out um with any report if necessary uh let's do that now folks and we will come back out afterwards with any report if necessary thanks very much now reporting great thank you um uh continuing back in open session um the committee on special audit uh the committee met in closed session and uh, to discuss some items, uh, the committee has, uh, the closed session has nothing to report. And with that, we have completed the agenda for this committee meeting and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.